this uh, hearing. And uh, Secretary Azar, thank you for your, uh, your service and uh, the manner and the integrity you bring to approaching this uh, uh, current crisis that we face. Uh, I think clearly this is something that has to be approached and will be approached uh, in a nonpartisan um, uh, nature. Uh, a couple of the questions that I have uh, uh, relate to testing, and you talked about getting, uh, uh, I think, uh, diagnostics is the key with respect to this, both in terms of uh, containment and also in terms of uh, getting a, a handle on this. Uh, but I, my understanding is only five states' labs have received tests so far, uh, kits. Uh, my state hasn't in the state of Connecticut. How soon can they expect to get those? Uh, so CDC invented a diagnostic within, uh, uh, I think, a week of getting the sequence from China. Um, it has three steps to it. They probably, in retrospect, maybe over-engineered it a bit. We at CDC have done over 3,600 tests there. We have had no backlog. We've added staff, et cetera. We shipped to all of our labs the test once it was approved by the FDA. What we found was that in some labs, the third step of that, they were having trouble with getting a, control, a quality control validation on that, so it led to inconclusive results. We now, as of yesterday afternoon, the FDA authorized the use of those tests by using just the first and second step, provide a definitive diagnostic. So 40 labs are qualified to already be doing that. And then by this weekend, all 93 labs around the country that get these will have either CDC or on Monday, will have the private sector or on Monday uh, a modified test that's even easier. Uh, how about in the case of hospitals? Will hospitals be given the same a number of doctors and hospitals uh, in our major cities have raised questions with respect to this. How would you respond? Yeah, so that's the next step is working with the private sector and also CDC to develop a basically a bedside diagnostic. So that, that's really the next step we've got to get to. And I think part timeline with respect to that. I, I try not to make predictions or? about medical technology, but we've got, I think I heard the commissioner told me as many as 70 possible diagnostic makers are looking at how to get this up and running at the bedside. Well, uh, that's uh, encouraging to hear, but I know uh, from talking to a number of the uh, uh, docs in the hospitals, the sooner they're able to do this, obviously, the better, but I, I thank you. I just would add uh, uh, only as a, as a, a comment here, and uh, uh, given the bipartisan nature, uh, our dear colleagues on the other side of the aisle, when they, for eight years, had the ability to uh, modify the Affordable Care Act, uh, but they said they were going to replace and repeal it. Uh, and uh, they did very little other than weaken it. Uh, so it's heartening to hear that we're going to be pulling together uh, to strengthen that in a way, and especially in this time of crisis. And thank you for your service. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Secretary, for sharing your uh, expertise and insight. Uh, these are important topics that we are uh, discussing. It, it would seem to me that there's bipartisan agreement that there are a lot of problems with the so-called Affordable Care Act. And uh, the, the uh, question is, what do we do about that? And so I guess, <clears throat> first of all, uh, can we get your commitment to working with us uh, to, to navigate through this, and, and especially uh, can you commit uh, to the committee that the Trump administration would support pre-existing condition protections no matter what happens in the courts? President Trump has been adamant he will never approve any piece of legislation that doesn't protect pre-existing conditions in terms of replacing the ACA or fixing the ACA. Okay, thank you. I, I certainly appreciate that. I know he stated that in the State of the Union speech. We saw what the speaker's response to that was. Uh, but uh, certainly the American people uh, have, have suffered greatly in, in many ways. Constituents of mine who are paying thirty and $40,000 a year out of pocket when they were told, they were promised that they would save $2,500 <coughs> per year per household. So we can do a lot better than what is currently in, in place. And uh, we passed a bill here, here in the House that would have actually uh, reduced premiums. It was roundly criticized and opposed by, by folks who had supported the so-called Affordable Care Act. But I, I think uh, things are way too important for us to just dismiss and, and walk away uh, from bipartisan uh, concerns uh, that we know exist and, and that we want to address. 
Um, <clears throat> more specifically, I've been working on uh, rural health clinic legislation, and I know that uh, this is important to a lot of Americans all across the country. Uh, there is a uh, proposed prospective payment system for rural health clinics that uh, some of us are concerned might have some unintended consequences uh, that would uh, strain lower volume hospital affiliated clinics and, and push rural health clinics to prioritize volume over value in, in patient outcomes. Could you give us any detail on that about the proposed payment modernization and its expected impact on both independent and hospital affiliated uh, rural health clinics? So, Congressman, I had not heard of those concerns around the rural 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 clinic and a prospective payment system there, um, and I'd, I'd love to learn more about that with you because, of course, we don't want to do anything that harms rural health care access. In fact, we're trying to do exactly the opposite with the budget proposal and the rural health care initiative. So, uh, please, if offline, if we could discuss the concerns there, I'd love to hear them. I, I certainly appreciate that. I know that there is. Um, I mean, I'm impressed with uh, many of the delivery systems in rural areas. Of course, rural can mean different things in different parts uh, of the country. And, uh, and now, you know, Nebraska, my home state, uh, is, is a major player in coronavirus. And I guess, can you uh, perhaps uh, elaborate briefly, as time is limited, uh, on the quarantine efforts and how that can, you know, obviously uh, uh, prevent the spread of, of the virus? And, and we have quarantined uh, folks in Nebraska right now. Can, how can you assure that uh, we can contain this in, in the units that, that do exist. Yes, yeah, so the University of Nebraska, of course, is one of our finest institutions and it partners with us on the Ebola treatment center that we have there. Very and successfully biocontainment. So, I Absolutely. Um, and so this should really have no risk to any individuals in the community. The, these are highly contained, controlled environments where if an individual tests positive, even if they're not symptomatic, uh, they can't remain on military bases. And so we move them into these treatment centers that are negative airflow, appropriate containment units. Uh, they're treated with protective equipment, et cetera, uh, while they get better. And so, um, so this really is not a risk to anybody in the community and the visual may scare people, um, but they should be reassured, actually, by the quality of containment. Very well. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The, the notion that visual may disturb some people, but there are opportunities, perhaps, to be reassured. Um, I find reassuring that the administration is looking for two and a half billion dollars and may be open for Congress adding additional material resources. But I'm concerned about systematic cuts in this same area. I mean, the overall budget, as I understand it, is a 9% cut for the Department of Health and Human Services, 26% cut for U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, $693 million in cuts to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and $742 million in cuts to health resources and service administration proposals. Um, you started in 2018 uh, focusing on eliminating funding for the Obama era programs that, for disease security programs. Um, the Admiral Zemer, I think, who was tasked with uh, managing pandemics, quit, and his global health security team was dissolved. Um, the CDC was forced to slash its efforts to prevent global disease by 80 percent. It cut the complex crisis fund that was created uh, in the Secretary uh, of State's office by Secretary Clinton, a $30 million fund to be able to deal with that. Uh, cutting global disease fighting budgets at CDC, the National Security Council, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Health and Human Services. The budget cries out undermining the ability to respond in a global sense on the programs that were designed for situations like this. How are we to take comfort with the notion that you'd accept two and a half billion dollars to try and deal with a problem that has been created, yet over time this administration has been steadily attacking funding for the very programs that would help manage and perhaps prevent this outbreak. Do you care to give me some assurance? 
Absolutely. So in this budget, for instance, we increased by $135 million. Right. Over what the administration has done over, since, since it took office in this area. Well, that actually is an increase over existing funding. So $135 million over, over, over present funding for global health security, dis infectious cut. disease, and preparedness. That, that gets to a total of $4.3 billion at CDC. As I mentioned, we've increased CDC over the president's term by $670 million of, over that time, its annual budget. So it's been increased. Our budgets are an opening bid in interactions with you all. Uh, because we know how that how the dance is going to work on budgets, but where we get to has been consistent level increases uh, in these priority re programs. Reclaiming my time, I really would like to have some assurance in terms of the specific programs that were developed to deal with situations like a pandemic. There have been fluctuations up and down, but from 2017 on, it appears to me that you have this administration has targeted the very programs that provided the sort of infrastructure that would help us respond. Uh, and looking at uh, the uh, uh, modest adjustments in what you call an opening bid belies what this administration has done since it's been in charge. And I would appreciate having an opportunity to flesh out, comparing apples to oranges, what's happened over the three years that we've watched this stewardship. I appreciate your help. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed, to inquire for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the Secretary for being here today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my, my questions are going to be focused on the area of innovation and, and what you're referring, uh, what you're doing in regards to uh, the proposal and, and elsewhere. So just taking innovation in regards to the coronavirus situation. Uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have passed a bill uh, dealing with prescription drug costs that acknowledge and concede will negatively impact the amount of cures coming to the marketplace for the American citizens as a result of that proposal. So as we talk about budgetary cuts, I also want to talk about the proposals that will limit in innovation. And so if we don't have innovation, how are we going to get the treatments for things like the coronavirus? Am I missing something in, on, on what the policies we should be promoting here in the House should be? You're absolutely right, we, and we need the private sector to do this. We can do basic research, but to drive development across the finish line, whether vaccines or therapeutics or diagnostics, it's going to take partnership or even independent action by, by companies, and those companies are going to have to be able to have a reward on their endeavors. Uh, we propose at least a billion dollars of vaccine funding in the emergency supplemental, but that's got to be in partnership with somebody. So if that, um, if that partnership is not there and that innovative uh, environment of America, uh, pharmaceutical research and treatment research is not uh, uh, vibrant, issues like treatments for the coronavirus and else are going to be at risk of being delivered to the American people. Is, it, is that correct? They won't exist if we don't have a vibrant biopharmaceutical industry that's willing to, that's willing to put significant amounts of capital up for very risky ventures. We talk about vaccines and therapeutics as if they're a, a sure thing. Actually, we're going to have to put many bets out on the table to see what, see what comes forward and see what works. We don't know what off-target safety effects could be. We don't know efficacy until we get in human clinical testing on these things. So I, I appreciate that. So following up on that, one of the issues I've made a career, uh, my career in Congress uh, to dedicate it to is the issue of diabe diabetic care. Uh, being the father of a type 1 di diabetic myself, working with Diana to get on a bipartisan basis on the Diabetes Caucus. Uh, we've had some really great successes in regards to working with the Department of Health in regards to continuous glucose monitors being covered uh, at CMS, issues like the Omnipod being covered in the reimbursement policies. Uh, we just got the phone application uh, uh, use with the DESCOM, uh, the CGM uh, technology uh, approved through the system. And so I was very intrigued with your budget uh, proposal that looked at the issue of innovative alternatives to durable medical equipment for treatment and management of diabetes. Uh, it's a specific uh, provision in your proposal. So I just want to give you the opportunity. Uh, I applaud that innovative work. I applaud what's going on in the diabetic uh, research uh, uh, area. Uh, and as we dealt with a letter recently that got 218 co-sponsors on the letter to deal with the issue of pricing and payment reimbursement for the artificial pancreas, which is great, <coughs> exciting technology and innovation uh, in Amer America's private marketplace. Could you tell us exactly what you're looking to do in regards to that innovation uh, in regards to diabetic care? Sure. As you know, uh, Medicare Durable Medical Equipment, the program excludes coverage for non-durable 
alternatives to DME. So essentially we're stuck with durable. Uh, what we would propose in the budget is allow coverage of these non-durable alternatives to DME, both to save money but also to enhance options for patients, and it could come, come about exactly as you say in the, in, in, in the diabetic care arena. Uh, I know your passion on insulins also. I did want to say, you know, we're, on a, we're very close to a very important date when it comes to insulins. March 2020 um, is when we could see the first filing of applications for insulin biosimilars, which Congress has enabled, uh, and FDA has laid out a pathway for streamlined interchangeability and clinical information there. So we could, with insulin pricing, be seeing within the next year to two years a radical, radical transformation in every aspect of insulin pricing and delivery for patients. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kine. To inquire. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you uh, for your testimony here today. Uh, Mr. Burgess and I, Dr. Burgess, have introduced an immunosuppressant bill, and the administration has been favorable to it. It would extend reimbursement coverage beyond the 36-month cutoff. We think this is an important piece of legislation, and we encourage uh, the administration's continued support. I I'm also co-chairing with Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers of the Rural Health Caucus in Congress, and we appreciate you know, the focus that the administration is providing, given the uh, unique challenges that we face with our rural providers. We certainly encourage continued support for critical access designation, uh, thinking out of the box when it comes to the recruitment and retention challenges we have in rural areas, um, and also uh, a nationwide uh, broadband deployment for 5G in order to really ramp up the potential of telemedicine that we have. All these things, I think, with your leadership, we can start moving aggressively forward on. But like Mr. Buchanan, uh, I too had a telephone town hall last night. One out of every three caller in was talking about the coronavirus. So certainly the concern, if not the fear, is starting to permeate throughout our communities and throughout the country. Uh, and we do face, I think, some unique challenges in the rural uh, providers' fear of how we address the spread of this virus. How confident are you in regards to the infectious disease protocols that we have in place with our rural providers right now that they're up to the task of what's uh, appearing on our doorstep already with 47 countries, the first known non-origin source uh, detected here in the United States, it's coming, and I'm concerned whether we're, we're ready for that. I, I think it's a very fair question because, and it, one of the bedrocks of our system is our great hospitals, our great public health infrastructure, and our providers. That's how we're identifying these cases. Of the 15 cases that we've had here in the U.S. that weren't imported from repatriation, uh, all but one of them came from great doctors and nurses identifying symptoms and testing. I worry about infection control protocols in rural, in rural facilities, just they don't see it as much. And I, I do think we're going to, and perhaps the funding through the emergency supplemental can help with that. I think we have to up the game nationwide around immediate infection control on suspect cases so we don't get nosocomial infections. Well, I would also encourage the administration to really take a forward stance on the protection of our frontline rural health providers, the provider community overall, because if they start getting infected and start going down, then we are going to be in a world of hurt. And likewise, uh, how confident are you about the infectious disease protocols that we have in our schools? I mean, China now is shut down. Japan just announced they're shutting their schools down. South Korea, soon we're probably going to see it in Italy and sweeping through Europe. Um, are we ready at, at the school level to protect our children? Yep. So at the school level, it's like at the employment level. The most important thing one can do is if you're symptomatic, if you're not feeling well, you need to stay home and not go to school. You need to not go to work. It's really, Dr. Shuket spoke about this yesterday at the press conference. It's the same basic public health protocols for the common cold and for the flu, which is proper hygiene, washing your hands, covering your mouth, not touching your face with unwashed hands, and staying home if you're sick. Um, and we'll, we need schools to enforce that. We need employers to enforce that. It's also important we don't over scare and have people walking around with masks on. And that, that's, that's not what we recommend. That's not the safe way to deal with things. Well, one thing I'd recommend that you take back to Vice President Pence and the task force that's now formed is for us to start developing a strategy for online learning opportunities. Because, man, when this stuff starts spreading throughout the country, the natural reaction of parents will be to bring the kids home and try to protect them and take them out of school. And we can't afford as a nation to have them sitting at home without any course instruction in front of them for months at a time or however long it's going to take for us to get a grip on this. So, And then being uniquely concerned about those kids at home who don't have broadband access, who aren't going to have those same online opportunities as, as other children. So that's one recommendation for the task force to look at. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Secretary Azar, for, for being here today. Just last week, I brought together a, a, a roundtable in southeast Missouri with myself, the governor, uh, the state of Missouri, Mike Parson, and also some members from the White House in regards to um, talking about opioids, but also talking about uh, access to rural health care. And I know that that's been very important to you, and that's been important to the president, and I want to thank you for that being um, addressed within the budget. Um, for, so, for so long, it's been overlooked by prior administrations in addressing access to rural health care, and I'm glad that you're focusing on that. I'd also like to applaud the administration's continued focus on advancing American kidney health. Um, which has been a priority for myself and many other members of this committee. Um, American taxpayers spend more money on kidney disease annually than what we do on the Departments of Justice and Energy and the State Department combined. Even more alarming, of the more than 100,000 Americans who begin dialysis annually, one in five will die within a year. I think we can do a whole lot better. I know there's members of this committee that I work with that believe that we can do better. Your departments work to ensure fewer patients develop kidney failure to increase rates of home dialysis and to increase the number of kidneys available for transplants have not gone, un have not gone unnoticed. The potential benefits for the more than 700,000 Americans who have end-stage renal disease are immense. For most Americans with kidney failure, as you know, the best treatment is a kidney transplant. Unfortunately, the Medicare program will only cover the cost of immunosuppressive drugs for three years post-transplant. These drugs are vital, much like what Representative Kine had said earlier, in preventing a patient's body from rejecting their new kidney. Congressman Kine and I have introduced legislation along with some members in the ENC field um, to correct this misguided policy, and I applaud the administration for including that proposal in its budget request this year, so thank you very much. I understand that HHS recently issued some data indicating that providing lifetime coverage for those drugs would lead to cost savings. Can you please talk about that data and the administration's perspective on this issue of lifetime immunosuppressive drug coverage, and do you have any insights on the savings? Uh, so I don't have the exact number on the savings, but happy to get that to you. But yes, that's what we found is that by covering immunosuppressants, we save the kidney. By saving the kid, the transplanted kidney, it's a longer life, better health care for the individual, and really appreciate your leadership, and we're so delighted that that's in our budget. It's very important to us, and it's very important to so many patients across this country, so thank you. Also, Mr. Secretary, I hear there are still issues with organ procurement, organization performance. Um, it's something that a lot of members of the Missouri delegation, especially on the other side of the building, my counterparts, uh, care about. Um, what will you do to move the ball on organ donation overall? So we've got a proposed regulation out to enhance the accountability of the organ procurement organizations, to bring them all up to the higher standard. There's great variability in performance, both on procuring organs and on securing live human transplantation of those organs, successful transplantation. We've got to up their game by real accountability. I see my time's expired. Thank you for being here, Secretary. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, to inquire. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, Mr. Azer, uh, were you aware, were you told beforehand that the President was going to name Mr. Pence, Vice President Pence, to lead and uh, lead the charge against uh, the coronavirus. Did you know that? Well, of course I did, yes. You were told? Yes. I was consulted and told, yes. Okay, discussed thank you. Involved in it, consulted, discussed it, worked on it. And I'll be honest with you, my reaction when I heard the idea that the Vice President would be willing to help add his force of office to the to this effort, I said, I said quote, uh, that's genius. Mr. Azer, the administration has proposed 
a $1.6 trillion cut to health care programs and would destroy the safety net programs that millions of Americans, my constituents, rely on absolutely. A 9% cut for the entire health and human services cannot and does not lower drug prices. It doesn't protect pre-existing conditions. And it defends and defends Social Security and Medicare. It doesn't do those things. I'm not sure who you're trying to fool in presenting this budget or what you're trying to sell. The FDA's budget request expresses unequivocal support for the adding the device identifiers to insurance claims. Adding identifiers to claims would provide better data to track the safety and quality of implants over time, which in turn would improve the outcomes and reduce costs. However, CMS seems to disagree with the widespread agreement from across the health industry uh, and the HHS Inspector General. Yes or no? Will you finalize adding device identifiers to claims as the President's budget request claims? I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with disagreement at CMS, so I, I want to get back to you on a look at that. I, I had not known of disagreement on the device it's, identifier payment issue. It's a critical issue, Mr. Secretary. It goes back several years. No, I agree on the importance. It will help us respond because this industry has gotten away with literally murder. And if you know the court cases that were involved, you'll see how imperative this is. I'm worried this administration is not prepared for the global outbreak. Many of us are. We're not going to sit back and simply say it's in somebody in somebody's says We all have a responsibility here. Uh, especially when we hear the news of the first person-to-person -person transmission on U.S. soil. The President is tweeting about the stock market. Senior officials are lying about containing it. And I don't see a plan to manage the risk. So we sent a letter last week highlighting the concerns about the risk to the medical supply chain due to global dependence on Chinese manufacturing. We plan to ask Congress for additional appropriations, as public health experts have suggested. And what do you think about that supply chain? Is it in serious, does it have serious problems as far as you perceive? So we, we do have a real issue in terms of the supply chain being bound up so much in China. There is one bit of good news from our survey that FDA did. There are 20 products that are either whole or with a single source uh, active ingredient sourced out of China. So 20 of them, there's no alternative in that sense. We're aggressively monitoring, working with the industry. We're not aware of any potential shortages yet, um, but with device and pharmaceuticals, we are we're very much on the lookout for that and working to find alternative sites and supply chain. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pasquale. Let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweiker, um, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just a reminder to everyone, Medicare trust fund, five budget years, it's gone. So um, anything we're doing here that can extend that are ideas of not laying on top of it. So it's one thing to attack that, but also to deal with the reality where the math is right now. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, uh, how familiar are you with Democrats HR3? Fairly familiar. <laughs> okay. I, 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 there's something I've been passionately trying to get our brothers and sisters, both on the Republican and Democrat side, to understand. The cost savings from that piece of legislation comes from something um, in the vernacular is referred to as reference pricing. Um, so if you and I are in Great Britain, a what is, what's the formula? Um, a quality adjusted life year is worth $38,000. So if a pharmaceutical costs $40,000 but would give you a, an adjusted great year, they don't buy it. And it's that type of reimportation of that scarcity is how they save money on pharmaceuticals. We are desperate, both Republicans and Democrats, 
as you've already spoken about, to lower pharmaceutical prices. My fear is the unintended consequence that by doing that, that the high risk, high reward, small biologics, small molecules, even genomics that don't exist in those markets, that scarcity is going to be reimported here. They're about to wipe out small pharma and functionally protect big pharma because if they just wiped out the capital stack for all the small pharma companies that, that are creating the disruptions. Am I wrong? Tell, tell me, am I seeing it the wrong way? So I would be, I would be a bit uh, balanced on that in that, as, of course, the President and I have been very supportive of notions of reference pricing in Part B, where we are a price fixer and price setter, and we just do it pretty stupidly at 106 percent of average sales price. In Part D, though, where we actually have competitive marketplace that supply and demand curves are meeting to produce mar market competitive pricing for the most part, except in some areas where they've been precluded from negotiating, uh, that system really does work, and a system of reference pricing or price controls beyond that could lead to some real distortions in the system, as you said. Um, and we also, HR 3's so-called negotiations, it's not clear how implementable or practical those really could be as crafted. We want to work with Congress on a system to get prices down, but it's got to be practical. Have the Democrats that care about drug <coughs> pricing, have they been reaching out to your office and trying to come up with a method that actually would work without killing people because of the future curative drugs that will disappear? I'm not aware of that outreach with my office. I know there's been White House interaction with the Speaker's office. Uh, but uh, uh, we want to work on a bicameral, bipartisan basis. You know, we've got the, the grassley widen package in the Senate is one that is proven bipartisan. That's one example of how we might move forward. And real reform to Part D could bring huge benefit to our so, seniors. Uh, so I'm hopefully you're hearing we, we all have the same goal. Some of us are very fearful that if we destroy those disruptive curatives, that 5 percent of our brothers and sisters that have chronic conditions that are the most of our health care spending, we lose that cure that, you know, the single shot drug that cures hemophilia and these other things that are coming here. Um, there's one other, and this one's a little tougher. Like, I, I have a series of alerts on just tracking um, testing for the, for the virus. Here's a company um, out of Israel that just announced they think they have one that within 25 m minutes could do desktop um, analysis uh, on, on the drug. What do we as policymakers have to do to function legalize healthcare technology? The thing you blow into that could tell you have the flu and order your antivirals, except that technology today, because it's an algorithm writing the prescription, is substantially illegal. Um, how, do we, how do we work with you to actually do the technologies that could crash the price of healthcare? We work together. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. With that, let me recognize uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, is a respiratory disease, is it not? That's correct, sir. And at the, at the Center for Disease Control, you have an expert who directs your respiratory disease section, well, Jackie, don't you? Jackie, yes. There she is. And what is her name? Uh, Dr. Nancy Messonnier runs the, the respiratory and, inf and influenza branch, yes. And was it, was it your decision yesterday to exclude her from the press conference on this issue? No, we actually had her boss, the senior career official, uh, Dr. Well, Ann Shuckett, was at the press conference. Yes, she was you up did, here. but not, not the respiratory disease expert who was the truth teller, not unlike Dr. Lee in Wuhan, who spoke out on Tuesday, apparently drawing the President's attention, in saying we will see community spread in the United States. It's not a question of if this will happen. Uh, it is a question of when and how many people in this country will have severe illnesses. Do you agree with her statement? Uh, first, I know Dr. Messonnier extremely well over decades. Um, I have the highest respect for her. And yes, we we believe I, all there all will be no, no. It's very because if we, you have agree be, with we have to be careful with the public. I, I, as you Community know, spread. Do you agree with her or not? It, there is context needed. Community spread could be in a town, a locality, or could be nationwide like it China. Could, it could have begun okay. yesterday or day and before in North, Northern California. In fact, this, Let this me ask 15th you as case well, could be a community case. We as don't you know. know and saying disruptions to everyday life may be severe, but people might want to start thinking about this now. Do you agree with her on that? That was 
a statement of a range of possibilities, which is, yes, yes we're dealing with a is, pandemic. And there are elements really the question is whether or not the administration is moving based on this serious concern or just on putting a happy face on all this that will go away when the spring flowers come out. That's a complete and I want to misrepresentation. Pursue with you what some of the specific things the administration is and is not doing in that regard, beginning with the question of face mask. Uh, I'm sure you saw this, the story that the N95 mask that is important to those who are health care providers, that many hospitals only had a week's supply. What is the administration doing to assure that there's an adequate supply of those masks? We're asking you to fund us buying masks. I see. So we don't have them now, and 60 percent of uh, large chain pharmacies also say uh, that uh, they, they've, had, they've run out of masks for the public in general. Uh, on the question of lab tests, as you know, last Friday, the Association of Public Health Laboratories said that only three states had the capacity to test people for the virus. And in the case of what might be the first community spread in California, it's taken four days to determine whether that person had coronavirus. I've had this experience in San Antonio where it, any, for anyone to determine whether those people that came off the uh, ocean liner in Japan who are now at Lackland Air Force Base, we have to send the test off to Atlanta to get an answer on that. A problem about not testing people on the base, transporting them across town. Uh, I, Congressman Castro and I wrote you about this back in on February the 13th. Despite numerous calls, requests, it's been difficult to get any answer about the specifics on that, though my staff advises that finally in the midst of this hearing, some message came through from you about that. Uh, our localities, even considering trying to put people in recreational vehicles to keep them separate if they have the coronavirus uh, in, in full. Uh, the city of San Antonio has not received any reimbursement for these matters to date. Uh, it's unclear to me whether the administration has in place a plan to send extra reimbursement to localities faced with a problem uh, the ineptness with which the administration has approached this problem is not only serious, it can be deadly if uh, not changed in the approach. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Walarski, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Azar. Good to see you. Who's your face in front of this committee? Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to correct the record here to uh, my good friend down there, Mr. Pasquale. I have not seen or heard anything, I've not seen any evidence that any senior official is lying about what's happening with coronavirus. So I would like to say that, um, you know, I think we need to be very factual when we talk about this, and I think you have been, Secretary Azar. I think it's apparent for the American people to know that this is priority one at the administration. I've not seen any evidence that there's uh, anybody lying about what's happening with coronavirus, but um, I just want to uh, proceed by saying 10 years ago, Democrats rammed Obamacare through the Congress based on the slogan, if you like your plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you'll be able to keep your doctor. That slogan, of course, turned out to be a lie. In fact, it was rated as PolitiFact's lie of the year in 2013. Fast forward to today, and a majority of House Democrats have co-sponsored H.R. 1384, the Medicare for All Act, which would virtually outlaw all private insurance plans all the coverage and force every American into a one-size-fits-all government plan. So in just 10 years, we went from, if you like your plan, you can keep it, to if you like your plan, too bad, it's gone. What a difference a decade makes. Contrary to what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle might say, Americans do like their private insurance. <coughs> a recent Gallup poll found that 71% of Americans rate their private coverage as excellent are good. The American people and the hardworking Hoosiers that I represent want that health insurance that they like. They don't want that health insurance taken away and replaced with a massive new government program, especially one that would require massive new taxes on workers and families. Secretary Azar, can you talk about the financial impact for Medicare for All and what kind of impact it has potentially on seniors and middle class Americans that I serve in uh, Indiana 2nd District? It would be absolutely devastating. We've got 180 million Americans who get their insurance through their employer or their, more importantly, their union. Their insurance would be taken away. 
collective bargaining rights that they have given up in exchange for insurance would be taken away without compensation and wages. For our 60 million seniors in Medicare, a third of them depend on private insurance, Medicare Advantage, the ever more popular private option with added often dental, vision benefits, and pharmacy benefits for them taken away as part of this. It would be devastating for America's seniors. And let me ask you this. The rising rate of maternal mortality across the country is something I've been extremely concerned about, and I'm glad to see the Trump administration is actually tackling this head on. Your budget describes the Improving Maternal Health in America initiative aimed at improving maternal health outcomes through evidence-based programs. How do you see the maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting program fitting into the, the department's maternal health initiative? So that program gives pregnant women and families, particularly those considered at risk, necessary resources and skills to raise children who are physically, socially, and emotionally healthy and ready to learn. So it's a very important part of, of our maternal health initiative. I appreciate your efforts. And let me just quickly uh, bring to your attention here. Um, the administration's proposal to strengthen TANF focuses on work and families in, direct, in a direct alignment with the Republicans' Job for Success, Success Act. Are you worried about a lack of accountability in TANF? I absolutely am worried about the lack of accountability in TANF. We've got uh, dozens of states that are basically achieving their work participation rates without co contribution to it. Um, it has been perverted from the original meaning of TANF, which is to get people to work, get them trained. We've got to create real accountability again. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today and thank you for your testimony. In January of 2019, you granted South Carolina a waiver of federal anti-discrimination regulations to allow Miracle Hill Ministries to reject Jews, Catholics, persons of other faiths, non-religious persons, and LGBTQ individuals from being members to our caretakers of foster youth. Stated mission of Administration for Children and Families is to promote the well-being of vulnerable children and families. And the directive of the Children's Bureau is to act in the best interests of the children in its care. The crux of the waiver prioritizes the religious beliefs of an organization over the best interest of abused and neglected children, contrary to the stated mission of the Administration for Children and Families. As Secretary, your position is that it is acceptable for Miracle Hill to use Health and Human Services provided fund to reject Jews, Catholics, persons of other faith, non-religious persons, and LGBTQ individuals from being mentors to our caretakers of foster youth, correct? So first, to clarify, the Coalition for Jewish Values as well as the Roman Catholic Diocese of Charleston are supportive of the approach we've taken, which is that the, we have to support the prompt placement of children in loving homes according to the best interest of the child and we need as many providers, faith-based and non-faith-based, as possible to participate. So the, we should not be in the business of kicking out faith-based providers who are the backbone of so much of our foster care placement. So the answer is correct. Um, your question is, an, is not an appropriate question. It is, it sta you stated it as if, we are, uh, as if we are encouraging that. We are encouraging more providers, not fewer providers, because the priority is kids getting placed, not who the providers are. And let me ask, as the chair of the subcommittee of jurisdiction over programs critical to helping families and children in need, this budget is deeply disturbing and destructive to the health of the most vulnerable members of our nation. At a time when the Republicans gave windfalls to the wealthiest corporations and individuals, this budget slashes $200 billion from Medicaid and the Children's Health Program, cuts child care assistance for working families, takes nearly $2 billion from the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program, or TANF, eliminates the Social Service Block Grant, undermines Adult Protective Services 
Meals on Wheels, substance abuse programs, programs in rural areas, and mentoring. Could you assure us that these cuts are not going to negatively impact or take away services from the most, most vulnerable members of our society? So to achieve our budget targets and the overall administration caps agreed with Congress, we had to make some very difficult choices and we have to eliminate programs that are less effective, invest in priority areas, and support mostly those that provide direct services to individuals. Is your microphone on, Dan? So the answer is we're cutting programs that are vital to the well-being of these vulnerable populations because we had to make some tough, hard choices. We're removing programs that are ineffective, that, are, that have not proven results, and also focusing on those that most deliver direct services instead of those that provide infrastructure support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield Thank back. the gentleman. After we recognize Mr. LaHood, we will then proceed with committee practice and will recognize on a two-to-one ratio members on the Democratic side. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Uh, the country and our health care uh, system is well served by your leadership. I know you testified uh, yesterday for almost seven hours. You did the press conference last night, and you're here today for three or four hours. So thank you. Um, I just want to um, I want to talk about rural health care, but before I do that, I listened to Mr. Doggett's comments, and uh, he must have watched a different press conference than I watched last night because I objectively watched that entire press conference, and I think it couldn't have been more reassuring to the country. Uh, the team of physicians, researchers, medical personnel that were put in place by this administration and under your leadership uh, gave confidence uh, to, to the country. I know he mentioned, uh, talked a little bit about community spread. I wonder if you could just comment on that for a second. Thank you, because I do think that exchange could unnecessarily worry the American public. Um, when we say, when the CDC says, I say, the President says, that it is quite likely that we will see more cases and quite likely we will see community spread, um, that could be in one town, a locality, it could be in a neighborhood, it could also be nationwide. We say could, could, could. We have to prepare for all eventualities and we have to educate the public about the potential for eventualities. That does not mean they will happen, it means we responsible stewards prepare for them. Uh, we have this 15th case in California that could be a potential first community spread in the United States. We have to now do the epidemiology behind that. We have been consistent from day one about this messaging across all levels of the government. Thank you for that. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and I enjoyed hearing your comments at the beginning on your rural health care task force and putting the, the governor in charge of that. Appreciate that. Um, I am concerned about uh, rural health care. I have a district of 19 counties. I border Iowa and Missouri, and uh, very interested in this subject. And I know as part of your four-part strategy to transform rural health care, increasing rural access uh, to health care is a priority. Uh, in Illinois, over the last five years, frequent mental distress in, has increased by 14 percent, and suicide now is the third leading cause of death for people ages 15 to 35 in Illinois. Healthcare providers in my district are focused on the need for increased behavioral health and mental illness services to address these troubling statistics. And while there are many examples of innovative health approaches uh, in my district, I just want to point out one. Unity Point Health in Peoria, Illinois, is working on solutions to help broaden access to behavioral health providers through community organization partnerships. And they recently started a nonprofit organization called Unity Place that will work to better understand the unique mental health needs of rural communities in my district and how to transform our behavioral health system to ensure better delivery uh, for these ne necessary health uh, uh, systems and services. I wonder uh, if you could discuss some of the successes you've seen um, from the, some of the programs and how the department plans to expand access to programs like the behavioral health workforce education and training program and the zero suicide initiatives. Absolutely, and as, as you said, uh, we need better behavioral health and mental health care in rural America as well as all America. Um, we've got to have a sustainable business model. They've got to work that they're economically viable. We've got to make sure that we're focused on key activities like suicidality, mental health, prevention, health promotion. And then third, we have to use telehealth. So telehealth can be an important part of behavioral health delivery in rural America. 
in using technology and innovation. And fourth, we've got to get the next generation of providers, whether nurse practitioners or, um, or, or primary care or PAs, and let people practice to the maximum of their license, especially in rural America. Well, we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I'm going to be really honest with you. The budgets that have come out of this administration in each year have been truly upsetting, and the budget this year is no different. I said this before, and I'm going to say it again, that I think the President's budgets are out of touch with the needs and the concerns of everyday Americans. Uh, once again, the administration is putting the well-being of the ultra-wealthy and corporations over that of hard-working American families. And the people that I represent and hear from every day would suffer greatly under the devastating cuts that are in his budget proposal. Uh, Mr. Secretary, could you clarify if the administration thinks that children and adults should go hungry? And a simple yes or no answer will do. So the administration is fully funded in line with what the Congress did previously, the Head Start program, the child The question child, that I asked you was program, whether or not he thinks that children that and adults should go hungry, because this administration's budget is cutting $181 billion from SNAP over the next 10 years. There's also a $500 million cut to the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, otherwise known as WIC. And in 2016, 41 percent of WIC participants were Latino. So the administration, through these devastating cuts, is actively making it harder for millions of Americans to receive, receive help with something as simple as putting food on the table. And I might remind you that one in every five SNAP recipients is a military family at that. I'm not sure what your values are, but back in the district that I represent, we don't believe in letting kids go hungry or those that are in need go hungry. A country as great and as rich as the United States of America should not see food insecurity among its population and slashing the budgets of vital programs that provide basic necessities to human beings in this country, those programs should not be on the, on the chopping block. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised, though, because this is the same administration that puts children in cages, so I could see how food might not be a priority for them. Um, where I come from, people's actions are worth a lot more than what they say, than what their lip service is. Um, President Trump, in his State of the Union address, said, and I'm quoting him directly, I've also made an ironclad pledge to American families. We will always protect patients with pre-existing conditions, and we will always protect your Medicare. Um, does President Trump's budget protect patients with pre-existing conditions, people who have cancer or diabetes? It absolutely does and will ensure the protection against pre-existing conditions. The problem is the Affordable Care Act doesn't actually do what it says it does. When you well, I'm going to stop you, you right there because the President's budget doesn't protect seniors or people with disabilities on Medicare. Um, it's fascinating that the President's vision for health care requires an $844 billion cut to health care. I'm going to say that again. $844 billion cut to health care. Again, actions speak louder, louder than his empty words. If he wants to protect people with pre-existing conditions, why is this administration arguing in favor of a lawsuit that would do the exact opposite, and that's take away protections for people with pre-existing conditions? My district has over 300,000 non-elderly people with a pre-existing condition. Why is he trying to mess with their, their health care? Um, these sabotage attempts to our health care system and our immigration system are hurting and scaring millions from getting much needed medical care. So uh, as much as you want to stand up here and defend the president, um, this administration has made it more than clear on where they stand with the American public. This budget is not fair for hardworking families in my district or for families across this nation. And nothing that you can say reverses what the actions show. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, I, I Let back. me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins, to inquire. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on Monday, January 13th of this year, President Trump, in a tweet, said, and I quote, that I was the person who saved pre-existing conditions in your health care, end of quote. Um, how did he do that? 
The President is going to ensure that any health care reforms protect pre-existing conditions, unlike the Affordable Care Act, where a 55-year-old couple in Missouri making $70,000 a year and are unsubsidized would pay over $30,000 a year in premiums and have a deductible of over $12,000. That's a meaningless insurance card. That's not actual protection of pre-existing conditions. He's the one committed to actually doing that if Congress will work with him. And concurrently is trying to invalidate the only law that exists that protects people with pre-existing conditions. So in other words, before the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, an insurance company could deny you coverage if you had a kid who was stuck with childhood cancer. You can't do that anymore. It's against the law. Um, there are a number of pre-existing conditions whereby an insurance company could jerk you around just because you were born into a, uh, a predisposition, a predisposition to uh, a pre-existing condition or a chronic illness. Uh, there's a, there was a lawsuit in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, challenging the constitutional, constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, the only law, the only law that protects people with pre-existing conditions and it was July of 2019, it was called Texas versus Azar. Uh, that's you. And there was a suit brought by 18 state attorneys general and endorsed by the administration to invalidate the individual mandate and thus the entire Affordable Care Act. Again, the only law, the only law in the books it protects people with pre-existing conditions. How do you reconcile that? First, that's actually a false statement. Um, ERISA protects individuals with pre-existing conditions, the 180 million individuals who have insurance from the private sector employers as well as, as, well as their unions. Right. Medicare protects for 60 million Americans, individuals with pre-existing conditions. Medicaid protects individuals with pre-existing conditions. And in the Affordable Care Act litigation, this is a litigation position, not a policy position, and the President has made it clear that he will veto any piece of legislation that doesn't ensure in the individual market actual, effective, and real. Mr. Mr. Secretary, coming back my time, the replacement to the Affordable Care Act that Congress tried to repeal and was defeated in the Senate had a provision as it relates to pre-existing conditions. And that provision said that an insurance company could not deny someone coverage for a pre-existing condition, but the coverage didn't have to include the treatment for the pre-existing condition. That is fact, and that is cynical. And here is my concern with respect to what we're dealing with now. While the flu and COVID-19, which is a disease caused by the coronavirus, may not be pre-existing conditions, those with pre-existing conditions, asthma, chronic congestive heart failure, young kids under the age of five, the elderly, are at greater risk because of their pre-existing conditions to become much worse triggered by this flu uh, or this uh, COVID-19 that we're dealing with. And it is very clear to me and anybody that looks at this uh, based on fact that the only law that exists that protects people with pre-existing conditions is the Affordable Care Act, and you're trying to destroy that. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, to inquire. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you uh, for being here. Let me just reply to the recent conversation. One, in the bill that we passed in the House of Representatives, we were giving states the opportunity for a waiver if they had a high-risk or pre-existing condition program that actually functioned better than the federal program. That was the purpose of that. But also, let me go again to, to the budget. Medicare gets another 20, the President's budget, Medicare gets another 25 years of life under this budget, and Medicaid grows year over year. Let me point out that this is, there's more than one body in this government that we have. And budgets aren't law, they're a template. And you can rant all you want, but I find it interesting to complain about the President's budget when that there is no House budget. Present your House budget, and that's what drives the conversation. 
So I would be hesitant to be too critical of the president's budget if you don't have one yourself to make the recommendations. It's easy to criticize, but it's better if you have your own solutions. Mr. Secretary, I'm glad to see you here and, and that you're going to focus on rural health care. That's very important to me, as you are probably aware. We have a nice bipartisan task force with Representative Sewell, Sewell Davis, Arrington, and, and me. We want to address, address workforce shortages, reimbursement, and payment schedules. Uh, to have some flexibility, especially for rural areas, digital and telehealth, and what we've come to call the social determinants of health, which I know are valuable and important to you that we, ad it's, that we address those issues. Uh, another focus that I have in particular, too, is on graduate medical education. We can talk about health care all we want. If we're not graduating enough physicians and we don't have residency programs for them, none of this really makes much difference, does it? So I think that that's one of the things that I would like to work with the administration on, along with these, these priorities for rural health, which I know are priorities of yours. And, um, you know, we can do better. Residency programs in rural areas, a lot of times people stay where they train. That's very common in, in medicine, as we both know. So how can the task force here on Ways and Means coordinate efforts with HHS uh, to, to really serve our rural communities better? Uh, so we'd love to work together on improving rural health. One of the ideas you just mentioned around graduate medical education is in the budget, which would merge Medicare, Medicaid, and children's graduate medical education, take it off the books for Medicare, put it on general tax revenue, which is where it should be, and allow flexibility so we get out of the structures that were frozen in place in the 90s and allow people to have GME in rural America, have primary care, psychiatrists, the the have that flexibility to meet our underserved needs right now. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's not just rural. We have urban underserved areas that would benefit from the same type of approach. Uh, my, my district is southern Ohio, as you're well aware. That's ground zero for our drug problem. It's not just opioids, heroin, et cetera, meth, uh, on and on. Can you tell me about the additional flexibility in the president's budget that would allow us to use tools at our disposal, especially locally, to fight the broader substance abuse epidemic? Absolutely. So actually, was I was delighted last year when Congress added to the state opioid response grant program the ability for states to use money for methamphetamine and other stimulants, because in states, and I know I've spoken with the governor in Ohio, uh, in some states, methamphetamine is becoming more of an issue than, than even opioids. In some states, it's always been. We've got, uh, we've got 15 of the 36 states that report overdose deaths by drug type, meth use, was responsible for more deaths than synthetic opioids like fentanyl. So that flexibility is critical for our, our states. Well, thank you. My, my time is up. I look forward to working with you and your team and with uh, my colleagues from across the aisle. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, in my Alabama district, we're always fortunate to get through each month without a hospital closure. I found out yesterday that we would not be so fortunate this month as one of my rural hospitals is going under. Without finances to pay their staff, one of our hospitals is set to close next week. When it closes, almost 150 people will do without a job, and over 20,000 residents will lose their only hospital, leaving them to, to have to drive within an hour to get to another okay. hospital. Sir, I have a letter that I'll present to you at the end of the today asking for your emergency assistance in trying to keep this rural hospital open. You know, the stakes are high, and I know that they're high, and I know that this administration wants to focus on that, but I saw that in the budget this year um, that there's a proposed cut to dish payments. These disproportionate payments go for indigent care, and I'm quite concerned that in addition to um, having um, a budget that doesn't reflect I think, uh, an emphasis on providing the health care needed, especially for those indigent in rural America. I was glad to hear that you are setting up a rural health initiative. As Dr. Winstrup said, our chairman, Chairman Neal, set up a underserved and rural health care task force. It's a bipartisan task force of which I'm co-chair, along with Dr. Winstrup, um, Mr. Arrington, and Mr. Davis. So we look forward to working with you, and I think one of the things that we need to start working on is the fact that these dish payments, which are so critically important for indigent care, especially in rural America, that we save those. I saw in the President's cut budget that he wants to accelerate the cut of these dish payments to this May. 
And what would happen is that the um, president's budget would cause um, a $4 billion cut in FY2020 and an $8 billion cut each year, 2021 to 2025. This was not good for Alabama. It's certainly not good for rural America, sir. My constituents and the health care providers in my uh, district can't stand another cut, and I look forward to working with you as well as with this uh, rural task force that we've set up to try to address that. Um, I'd like to now turn to CMS Administrator's proposal. Um, the CMS Administrator called for a proposal in um, Medicaid fiscal accountability. Um, it is causing a lot of angst in Alabama, and three of our major hospitals, uh, the CEOs, have asked for um, the proposal to be withdrawn. Healthcare in Alabama would be decimated by this uh, proposal. It's uh, the CMS administrator's proposal is called the Medicaid Fiscal Accountability. And um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, submit for the record uh, the CEOs of three of our major hospitals in Alabama. Uh, that's Children's Hospital of Alabama, U, uh, UAB, as well as uh, Ascension or St. Vincent's Hospital. So ordered. Um, a CMS post uh, suggested that the comment letters, like the letters I am going to submit, were alarmist estimates about the rules' impact on beneficiary access as being overblown. Uh, I assure you, Mr. Secretary, that the fact that the CMS administrator is now, this rule would change the way, the imbalance uh, the, that we currently have between state and federal funding and it does so without having an analysis. I'd like for your assurance that we would work with um, CMS to try to get either this rule withdrawn or actually have a, an adequate analysis of how this uh, state and federal funding imbalance would occur and how it would impact uh, beneficiaries in Alabama. Uh, have you, do you have any thoughts about uh, this proposed we, rule? I've and been, will you work with us to try to make sure right, that it's even on, on that on proposed that? regulation, I've obviously been hearing a great deal from states and hospitals, and we want to work with them on this. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Lady. The uh, Secretary and I talked about that a couple of days ago as well. Thank you. With that, let me recognize the General Lady from Washington State, Ms. Del Benny, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us today. Um, I think you said earlier that we're in active um, containment mode when it comes to the coronavirus. And I know there's work happening on a vaccine and other medical countermeasures, but um, right now um, I assume you'd agree that we're dependent on the ability of public health departments to identify, quarantine, and monitor those at risk of contacting um, the coronavirus and that it's really state and local public health that are going to do the lion's share of that work. Oh, they're absolutely the backbone, and in fact, the state of Washington and in particular King County have been, as always, tremendous partners in public health measures and great, wonderful to work with as we've been dealing with this. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so after reviewing the supplemental request to address the coronavirus, um, there it was light on details, and um, in just a few weeks, of managing the potential coronavirus exposure in our state, the Washington State Department of Health has spent over $1.7 million. Um, Snohomish County uh, in my district, which had the first U.S. case of the coronavirus, um, they spent $200,000 just to manage and monitor individuals who came in contact with that one person. And King County, which you mentioned, um, which is home to Seattle and the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport, which is doing screening now, is spending $56,000 a day to identify, monitor, and quarantine um, possible, possible patients. So my question is, um, can you give us a commitment that the administration is going to support backfilling state and local health departments for the work they're already doing on the coronavirus as well as support them going forward? Uh, so, of course, states are already receiving the $675 million annual payment for the public health emergency preparedness. I think Washington gets about $17 million for that. But the, the supplemental proposal does, in fact, cover and want to, and we'll work with Congress on what the appropriate amounts are. We've got, I think, over $600 million in there for CDC, but we'll work with you on if more is appropriate to support state and locals who are having to engage in added expense, hiring contractors, lab work, contact tracing. Um, so there's no current mechanism for reimbursement like that, but we'll work with you on what the appropriate mechanism in the SUP would be for that. Um, in the Zika supplemental back in 2016, um, they backfilled state and local public health departments. Did you know 
that. So I, there's We're not opposed precedent. to doing that. We'll ha we're happy to work with you as we work on a supplemental package of appropriate reimbursement for states if that's what Congress would like to do. Um, and that ended up being $44 million to, to, to those state and local governments. This is critical. These folks don't have lots of dollars to invest, and so I think it's important that we backfill, and I hope we have your commitment to do that. The state and locals are the backbone of our public health response, which is the core to everything we have to do here. Um, so I didn't get a yes there, so I'm a little concerned, but... Um, I, I said we're in, a, we're in agreement. We want okay. to work on the supplemental package to make sure the state and local governments are fully funded, including if there's reimbursement needed. We'll work with Congress if Congress wants to do that. We're, we're, we want to make sure the needs are met. Okay. Um, um, also, I just wanted to quickly ask you, in the President's budget, um, NIH is cut by 7 percent, and given that there's bi been a bipartisan majority in the House to support increased funding for NIH um, because of the critical work they do, and we've done that um, consistently now, um, in fact, last year, this current fiscal year, increase of $2 billion, and th that would take that away. Um, how do you support making a, or supporting a decrease to NIH funding? So Congress every year has been increasing the budget of NIH at rates that, of course, exceed the growth of revenue for the United States. It's 28 percent up since FY 2016, I believe. Um, Congress obviously will make the final decision on this. I've got the largest non-defense discretionary budget. If I've got to meet a 9 percent decrease, NIH is the largest discretionary pocket of that. Obviously, we know Congress will make different choices likely, as they have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your leadership, your good work uh, to make our health care system more affordable, to give greater access, to maintain and even improve the quality of care. I think you're doing a great job. And I appreciate all your efforts, uh, your sense of urgency, uh, your commitment to taking on this very serious uh, threat of the coronavirus. I think. Uh, I'm comforted that you're leveraging every tool and every resource, public and private. And my uh, comment there is, whatever we can do to help you, please let us know. And we're all in this together. Um, I represent hardworking farmers and ranchers that put the food on our tables and clothes on our backs. And I'm proud to be their voice here. Um, I was with a good friend from my college days at Texas Tech, Pat Green, a famous Texas singer-songwriter. One of his songs titled Small Town Family Dream goes like this. Daddy was a farmer like his daddy was before. It only seemed fitting. I walked through the same door. The only problem with it is too few of the next generation of farmers and ranchers are going to walk through that door. We don't do some very critical things with respect to sustainable health care. Now, we got a farm bill. Republicans led the effort, but it was a bipartisan bill. This president's working to hit reset with China and get fair and reciprocal trade relationships that put our producers first, put America first. We've uh, reduced the tax burden. We've removed some of the unfairness, like with respect to the death tax. People literally sell their family farms that are handed to them because they can't afford to pay the taxes. We've reduced unnecessary and ridiculous regulations like the waters of the U.S. I could go on and on, and I just appreciate all the good efforts, but we have to give these young families that are going to be our ag producers and provide the country with a safe, affordable supply of food, give us ag independence, like energy independence, strengthen our nation's security. That will only happen if they have access to basic care. And you and I both know, and we've had great discussions, and I appreciate your leadership in this, in this area, but half of the 2,000 roughly rural community hospitals are operating at a net loss. And, and that's up 40% over the last three years. So we're in a crisis mode. We've lost over 100 hospitals over the last several years. A, a, a few of those are in my district. And I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for allowing me to be part of this leadership team, this task force, Ms. Sewell, Mr. Winstrup, Mr. Davis. Uh, we've met. Uh, we're uh, of one accord, um, and uh, we are ready to tackle this. And I believe our chairman and my colleagues on the Democrat side are going to solve this, and we're not going to let this get bogged down in the petty politics of this place. We're going to do something to give these guys some breathing room out there. 
And we talked about telemedicine, telehealth. I ran a telehealth company where we were piping in specialty care to rural hospitals in Childress, Texas. It was saving lives. And I appreciate your efforts around that. I, I, I was reading about the uh, vir virtual uh, uh, payment, virtual care, the payment code that you're changing to encourage and leverage technology, um, revise the Medicare wage index so that we have greater fairness in low-wage communities. I just want to say thank you, and I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get to a place where we have that solution and we get it across uh, both sides of the aisle, both chambers, and to the president so that we can give rural America a fighting chance to continue to bless this nation. Thank you. Thank Mr. the Secretary. gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to inquire. Yes. Secretary Azar, I would like to discuss how rumors and misinformation about the ongoing outbreak of coronavirus is impacting Asian Americans throughout the country. As a representative of a district with one of the highest Chinese American populations in the country in Los Angeles, I believe it's our responsibility as public officials to stem misinformation and reassure our constituents not stoke fear and resentment. Uh, this is critical because we've already seen examples of xenophobia directed at Asian Americans in this country. A woman on the subway in New York City was attacked by someone calling her vile names because she wore a face mask. In Indiana, two Hmong guests checking in a hotel were told that Asians were not welcome. And in California, a 16-year-old uh, high school student, a boy, was sent to the emergency room after being attacked at school by bullies who accused him of having the coronavirus simply because of his ethnicity. Even just looking Asian has been enough to incite attackers to hurl insults and accuse the individuals of being disease carriers. So yesterday I sent a dear colleague letter to my colleagues in the House and Senate urging them to refrain from repeating unfounded conspiracy theories and instead to commit to only sharing verifiable information from reliable sources like the CDC and local public health agencies. Secretary Azar, as recently as Tuesday, you referred to COVID-19 as the China coronavirus, which a reporter pointed out could further fuel these racist incidents. Uh, Secretary Azar, I've been listening to you carefully uh, all morning, and uh, I commend you because you have been using only the term coronavirus and not China coronavirus. I thank you for that. Will you commit today to no longer referring to the virus by region, but by the term coronavirus or its designated official name, uh, COVID-19? And yes or no, is it sufficient? Yes, I took that feedback to heart from that reporter, absolutely. It was Thank a shorthand you. just for easy understanding. It was not intended, but you're absolutely right. We must ensure nobody's discriminated against based on ethnicity. Ethnicity is not what causes the novel coronavirus. In fact, will you affirm that racial stereotyping is not an effective way to prevent the spread of COVID-19? That is absolutely correct. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Secretary Azar, an, an, another yes or no question. On January 24th, your Office of Civil Rights issued a notice of violation to my state of California, erroneously claiming that California is in violation of the Weldon Amendment because we ensure that all health care coverage offers the full range of reproductive health care, including abortion. What's worse, in this notice, OCR, OCR threatens to rescind hundreds of billions in federal funding for California, but does not specify where this funding will come from. Secretary Azar, will this funding HHS is threatening to take from California come out of our CDC emergency preparedness funds to help combat the spread of coronavirus? Again, yes or no? Um, the state of California has refused to bring itself into compliance, and I've referred that to our lawyers to look at what appropriate penalties would be that we would act upon, but they should be proportionate and related to the nature of the program involved. Then I want to ask Secretary Azar again, yes or no. Were you aware that there was a 2016 determination by the Office of Civil Rights that determined that California was in compliance with the Weldon Amendment and that nothing has changed since then in California's approach? Yes or no? Uh, I believe there was different leadership coming to that conclusion. We believe it's a black and white straight answer of, of straight violation of the law, black and white violation of the law to force nuns to buy abortion coverage when the statute, the Weldon Amendment this Congress passed, says you may not force an insurer or a plan sponsor to pay for abortion coverage for any reason. 
I yield back. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, to inquire. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And um, it, it's really four minutes certainly is not enough to cover uh, all of the budgetary questions, so I'll try to get through this as fast as possible. Um, uh, thank you for appearing, Mr. Uh, uh, Secretary. Um, the budget proposes to cut uh, over the over the budget uh, window $21 billion for Medicaid transportation. And I guess a lot of arguments could be made for dynamic scoring. <laughs> Don't you think that missed appointments uh, for cancer treatments, dialysis, people uh, who uh, have high blood pressure would increase the morbidity rate and thus really increase the cost of health care? So the Medicaid transportation proposal would be to make that an optional benefit, and that has been a source of tremendous fraud and abuse, and so it would make Th it a there state There is no option. evidence that there's a lot of fraud and, and, and abuse in the program. Uh, I, I beg to disagree. We believe there is evidence of, of misuse of the program. Okay, funds let's, we, we'll agree to disagree since I only have four minutes. The Medicaid uh, fiscal accountability rule, which really changes the ability uh, of, for states to um, uh, to meet their maintenance of effort uh, in various ways, this will tremendously reduce the ability of states to meet their um, uh, their commitment to Medicaid. Uh, to what extent does the budget account for that and continue to provide Medicaid service to the needy populations? So I don't know if the reform to the state intergovernmental transfers in the MFAR proposed regulation is actually built into the administration, the administrative budget there, but I've, I've told the chairman that uh, I am hearing very clearly through this process the feedback of states and hospitals. We're going to take that feedback to heart as we look at Thank that. you for taking the feedback because it's really necessary. Um, let me talk a little bit about the TANF proposals. There's a slight increase in child care. Thank you for that. But you also cut the social services block grant. You zero out the health opportunities, uh, the health worker opportunity program, which might uh, enable some welfare recipients to get meaningful employment. Um, how do you, this is a program that uh, was stuck uh, at 1994 levels, so how do you justify a cut uh, in uh, welfare when we continue to see people, uh, the, the growing need, and especially for child care? Actually, in, in terms of TANF, given the booming economy, the historic un, uh, low unemployment rates, uh, we should see and are seeing a decline in roles of, of well, welfare. Well, we're kicking people off, sir. Well, what I, my question specifically is you're reducing opportunities for people to, in fact, get economic opportunities by zeroing out the, the health uh, worker training program somewhere where, you know, welfare recipients might uh, logically go. Also, child care, by cutting out the social services block grant funds, uh, reducing TANF funding, you're uh, increasing the burden of, by definition, these are women with children, to be able to receive child care, even with that small uptick. Uh, of child care funding, it will tremendously reduce the ability for states to provide child care. What's the, what's the reasoning behind this, sir? So we, this has been a major investment area for us. We actually propose a $1.3 billion increase in child care, including a $1 billion mandatory investment but, but in innovation. But never has the child care parents. pot been big enough. They've always combined it with TANF funds, with supplementary funds, with social services, black red funds, and you're cutting those other things. You understand my point? I understand your point, but the social services block grant is one that doesn't have discernible outcomes, goes for, goes for basically it, it, well, it feeds services. elderly people. It, it, it has discernible outcomes in our communities, and I know you're glad my time is up. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, thank you for, <clears throat> for being here. First off, I, I want to thank you for your service to America in this position. It is an enormous uh, branch of the federal government, and I know it is an extreme challenge to manage all the, the moving parts, so, so thank you so much for your efforts there. Um, I'd like to start with a couple of questions on antimicrobial resistance. Um, I think this is a good time to talk about giving what we've seen, uh, the public health crisis, um, that, uh, the, the, the potential health crisis that we have with uh, dealing with the coronavirus. Um, 
As you know, the antimicrobial resistance letter that I and several of my uh, Doc Caucus colleagues sent uh, earlier this week, um, and, and you're aware, I, I hope that you're aware that uh, that, that came from us, um, that this issue is critically important. And now given the fact that we have more emerging threats to public health, um, it, it's, it's going to be an important issue in the future. Um, as you're aware, the letter focused on the marketplace challenges that are hindering the development of new antibiotics. And I kind of want, want to get your thoughts along, along those lines. I also want you to comment on the challenges with the creation of new antibiotics to fight the superbugs. Um, you know, how, how, how are we going to meet that demand? Can we do that domestically? Um, I think we've seen some exposure here that so much of our pharmaceutical pipeline is now comes from China. We've seen what happens there. Um, can you can you speak a little bit to that um, very quickly? I've got an, an, another question, but if you if you can if, if you could speak to that, I, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. So scientifically and technically, we can and are making advances. So Bardo, which is funding development of antibiotics, we have 16 novel antibiotic projects. We've got 38 projects in Carbex, <clears> a total of 54 in our current portfolio. We've dragged three new antibiotics across the finish line with FDA approval. The bigger challenge is not scientific, it's market-based. And effectively, we, it looks like we're facing a market failure problem because we're asking companies and us to develop an antibiotic, but then to use it sparingly, which is not necessarily a sustainable business model. So I've asked my team, want to work with you all, how do we think about this maybe in the countermeasures approach of government, government backing, et cetera, for a market failure situation? So, would, with that in mind, would you be willing to continue to work with Congress to develop solutions to this problem? Absolutely. It's vital that we do so. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I could, if I could enter in uh, the letter that we... So ordered. And um, also, there's a, there's a recent op-ed that was in the Washington Times that highlights that. If I so could, ordered. If I could enter that as well. All right, finally, Mr. Secretary, um, you know, in talking about eliminating in, uh, ineffective programs, um, I believe the administration's budget does not propose reauthorizing the, the health professional opportunity grants and correctly asserts that the program is duplicative of 47, 47 other training programs of, of, that the federal government operates. In addition, it's been, it's been shown to be completely ineffective at improving work outcomes. In a recent long-term evaluation analyzed impacts on participants using a three-year randomized trial, and the evaluation confirmed that the program had no impact on employment or earnings and did not decrease the individual's public assistance use. Last year, one of, every one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle voted to expand this program by over 500 percent. It's baffling to me that we continue to fund ineffective programs that waste government taxpayer dollars. Um, and really, if folks really cared about helping families in, in, in poverty, they would spend more time making sure the federal dollars go to those programs that actually work. Most importantly, the best way out of, out of poverty is a job and being prepared for those jobs, and we need to have the most effective training there. So with that, I, I, will, I will yield back, but thank you. Thank again, the gentleman. Sir. Let me recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, to inquire. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, um, for being here. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, if I could just be blunt, uh, I assume you have some awareness of the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Are you yes, generally of aware of the yes, of course. situation there? Um, thank you. I want to address that. Uh, I was pleasantly uh, surprised to see that the CDC's uh, fiscal year 21 budget highlights the really good work done by Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha and her team at the Flint Lead Registry. Uh, in response to the water crisis. And if I could just read directly from the CDC's budget document, quote, CDC worked with local health departments to connect more than 90% of the children with elevated lead levels to follow-up services. Medicaid expansion increased access to screening, health care, education, and social services for affected children in the Flint community. CDC support has enabled Michigan State University to implement an innovative, one-of-a-kind lead exposure registry, creating the model for the nation's first lead-free city, unquote. So this budget document also correctly states that lead exposure harms a child's health. We all know there's no safe level of lead. It can affect growth, 
and development, hearing, speech, IQ, academic ach achievement, and behavior. And we are really seeing this in, in terms of behavior. So even though my hometown of Flint has made progress since the water crisis, lead poisoning is still a problem for Flint's children and families, and we'll be grappling with this for a long time. Congress authorized the Flint Lead Registry in a bipartisan effort uh, through my legislation, which was signed into law in late 2016. And I'm now working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to reauthorize this program. We do these things in five-year bites, and we need to get it reauthorized. So my first question is a simple one, and that is whether uh, the Trump administration, who obviously views this work as important and successful, will commit to work with us to reauthorize the Flint-led registry. Well, we'll be happy to work with you on that. I can't, of course, st do a statement of administration position, but we'll, it's a critical public health priority that we'll work with you on, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm also pleased to note uh, that the administration in this document highlighted the critical importance of Flint's Medicaid expansion waiver, which was very much a part of the response to the lead crisis. Uh, the expansion also expires next year, and my office has been working with the state of Michigan and with officials in the city of Flint to get the expansion extended. It was planned to be extended at the time that it was initiated, but as we know, these, um, these waivers have a lifespan to them. So Secretary Azar, Secretary Azar, I think more importantly, because this does fall clearly within uh, your jurisdiction and authority, can I get a commitment from you to work with Michigan officials, with my office, and with people uh, representing the city of Flint uh, to uh, to extend this, uh, expand the waiver, uh, and extend it so that children can continue to receive the critical services that the highly successful lead registry makes them um, uh, uh, eligible for. So I, I don't have the details on that waiver, but we'll be happy to work with you and the state to, to I'll check with the CMS administrator and see if there are any issues and be happy to work with you on that. Thank you. I will note that this is important. This is the most important priority uh, for me in terms of, of uh, the work of your department at this moment. And I want to make sure that we can continue to do this work. And I am concerned that in an era where it appears that there's a, there's a, a desire on the part of the administration to reduce uh, expenditures in, the, in, in Medicaid, that these very important uh, programs uh, will be difficult to continue. And I, I just hope that we can reconcile those two. Thank, Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, to inquire. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to highlight uh, serious concerns about a recently proposed change to Medicaid, your uh, Medicaid fiscal accountability rule. I'm leading a bipartisan letter with my Ways and Means colleague from the other side of the dais, Representative Kelly, that dives into the impact this proposed rule would have on health care for some of the most vulnerable Pennsylvanians, mostly children, seniors, and low-income individuals. Seeing as the administration admitted to not knowing what the impact of this rule will be, we are asking, again, on a bipartisan basis, to work with all, we're asking for you and this administration to work with all the stakeholders to ensure that this proposal does not place an insurmountable burden on our hospitals, networks, and providers. Now, in the interest of the, the brief amount of time I have, I'll let our letters speak to the specifics, but I just wanted for today to bring this letter to your attention and I look forward to your response. Uh, second, I did want to ask you about the, the coronavirus uh, happening literally at the same time as draconian cuts are being proposed by your administration's budget. Specifically, I'm referencing the budget proposal to cut the Centers for Disease Control by 16%. Is it appropriate to stand by a 16% cut to CDC at the same time we are facing a unique worldwide health crisis? So the changes at CDC are actually to chronic disease and prevention programs. The increases, we actually have a $135 million proposed increase on infectious disease, global health security, and preparedness. So we already had in there increases, and then of course through the emergency supplemental, undoubtedly there will be significant funding going to CDC. Well, and what we're also seeing though is a certain, to use a phrase, robbing Peter to pay Paul in terms of directing some of this increased funding that, that you're shifting. But 
In the interest of time, let, let me just um, delve into another point of our response to coronavirus. At a time like this, making sure that the people can trust what government officials are saying is really paramount, and we've seen that in, in previous crises. So I was concerned uh, just yesterday, when the president called a press conference, and he referred to only 15 cases of coronavirus, when the CDC has confirmed that it's 60. The president said that Americans are not at risk to contract the disease, but literally the same day the CDC confirmed that an American living in Northern California contracted the disease without traveling outside the U.S., or apparently coming in contact with another patient to, known to have, have the infection. So I ask you, who should Americans trust, the president or the CDC? Um, your statements misrepresent what the president said. He said there are 15, as, as I did in my opening statement, there are 15 cases from individuals in the United States who traveled to Wuhan or their spouses. There are 45 additional cases from individuals we repatriated from Wuhan or from the Diamond Princess, and that's exactly what the president said. That's our data. That's the CDC's data. Yeah. And Let me just re reclaim my time. Thank you. And, and since I only have under a minute, I do just want to reiterate something that I went into at length a couple weeks ago when the OMB director was in front of the Budget Committee and focused at length on the scale of the proposed cuts to Medicare and Medicaid. So I just want to briefly read into the record what, not me, but what the American Hospital Association has said about these, this proposed $500 billion cut for Medicare and $900 billion for Medicaid. The AHA has said, quote, this budget would result in hundreds of billions of dollars in cuts that sacrifice the health of the seniors, the uninsured, and low-income individuals. We in Congress cannot allow these cuts from this administration to move forward. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Nunez, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I follow up to what I said yesterday in our China trade hearing, I wanted to enter in the record a piece from this morning's Wall Street Journal called Trump versus the Coronavirus. Of note, the author writes, and I quote, a Medicare for all system in the U.S. with minimal private hospitals or physicians would collapse beneath a real virus crisis. Medicare for all would smother the public-private infrastructure in the U.S. that develops, manufactures, and distributes life-saving therapies for viruses or anything else." Unquote. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are several legislative proposals to address the high cost of prescription drugs. Some of them have no chance to be enacted into law like Speaker Pelosi's H.R. 3, which the President has already said he would veto. However, there is a broad bipartisan agreement that Medicare Part D needs to be reformed and modernized, H.R. 19, the only bipartisan bicameral drug reform bill, would cap seniors' drug prices at no more than $259 per month. That's real relief we can accomplish right now. Mr. Secretary, the administration's budget includes a Part D out-of-pocket cap and further policies to improve that benefit. How are the Part D reforms in H.R. 19 consistent with the budget, and how would it lower patient out-of-pocket costs? Yep, thank you. One quick clarification. The case yesterday is unknown etymology, but it is not from the repatriation. I just want to clarify that. As to, as to the H.R. 19 and Part D reform, what we can do is limit seniors out of pockets to no more than $3,100 a year, the first ever catastrophic cap on what people would pay, seniors would pay for their drugs, and we could allow them to opt into spreading that cap over the course of the year such that each month the senior would be guaranteed to never pay more than $258 a month for their drugs no matter what the cost of their drugs. What a historic opportunity we have if we could just get our act together and work on a bipartisan, bicameral basis to enact these reforms and bring that kind of savings to seniors from and out of pocket. Your budget is matching up with the reforms in H.R. 19. That's consistent with the budget, absolutely. Okay. Uh, furthermore, uh, Mr. Secretary, we hear a lot of proposals that the federal government should step in and dictate drug prices to manufacturers. When Congress created Medicare Part D, it did so with the belief that private organizations, which are already administering employer-sponsored drug benefits, could be used to administer a Medicare drug benefit and under Medicare Part D drug plans compete against each other to provide the lowest price to beneficiaries. So I have one additional question. Do you think the government can negotiate a better deal than what the plans have been able to negotiate over the past 15 years? Um, as Peter Ortzeg, who ran the Congressional Budget Office in OMB under, in the Obama administration, has made clear, you can't get a better negotiation than these massive middlemen get unless you have a restricted formulary, meaning 
unless the United States government for all seniors is willing to deny access to drugs and ration them to seniors, you can't get a better deal than these middlemen do. It's, it's just, it's basic economics. They're not gonna hand you more money just because they like you. Thank you for that, Mr. Secretary. And I know you uh, have a real crisis on your hands and I wanna be respectful of your time. Uh, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to inquire. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, I, I read over the mission statement of the Health and Human Service. Mission of this department is to enhance the health and well-being of all Americans by providing for effective health and human services, fostering sound, sustainable advances in science. My understanding that's the mission statement. But I want to talk about the health care environment back in my district in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. Now, I know how many people don't know this, but Philadelphia is the home of the nation's first hospital, Pennsylvania Hospital. It was founded by Ben Franklin in 1751, and was born, I was born at that hospital a few years later. Since its founding, Pennsylvania Hospital has become renowned for its innovation and patient care and treatment practice and medical research. The city of Philadelphia has become one of the nation's most critical centers for health care healthcare research in the country. And while we have seen so many growth and innovativeness in our city, we've also seen our fear of challenges. Over the last 20 years, Philadelphia has experienced 20 hospital, 10 hospital closures with the latest one being Holloman Hospital, which made national news when it filed bankruptcy last summer. When a hospital shutters its doors, it does more in loss of a building. It's the loss of hundreds, if not thousands of jobs. It's the loss of resources for patients, families, and have come to trust and rely on for generations. Somewhere for me, they, they don't feel safe and for care. If that loss of education security for medical research, it is either the increased burden on neighboring hospitals or the scrambling for patients to find new doctors who they have to travel far distance. I've gone back home and they tell me, I want my hospital back. What is happening in Philadelphia can happen anywhere. Hahnemann is the canary in the coal mine. The loss of this hospital and all the disruptions that came with it should serve both as a warning and testimony to attention we must pay to this subject. Hospital closures are a lot of underlying issues and not you. So I say to you, Mr. Secretary, <coughs> that this is something that requires effort by the, the Congress and the executive branch of us working together. There is no simple answer. But the reason I read your mission statement is the budget inconsistent with your mission statement? Now, I know you don't have full responsibility of the budget because there's a budget office, but you make recommendations. So taking your mission statement and taking what I read in the case of Philadelphia, but you can read anything throughout, in your own judgment, and maybe you will say it or maybe you will not say it, but your mission statement and actually what you have heard, please tell me, that there's some inconsistency here with this statement? We never have unlimited funds. One could use that rationale for just unlimited expenditure on anything. One has to pick programs that work and make sense. I did want to say I want to thank you and I want to thank the chairman for arranging for the meeting that we're going to have to focus on Hahnemann Hospital, because you're right, the hospitals are vital parts of our community, whether in rural, urban areas, or underserved areas, and your leadership's been very important there, and I'm looking very much forward to our event together related to Hahnemann. I'd like to thank you and your staff, along with the chairman who came to the city of Philadelphia, for having this discussion, because it's not unique to where it all started in America. I keep reminding that to the chairman. He tells me about Ben Franklin from there, but the fact of the matter is, <laughs> We still there. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Ben Franklin of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Secretary Azar, for coming before our committee today. As you know, my home state of Illinois had the second confirmed case of coronavirus. 
as well as Chicago O'Hare, directly adjacent to my district, is one of the, of the select screening airports, passengers for China. That means that we have primary, secondary, and tertiary quarantine sites in and around my district. These facts have sparked a fair degree of concern and worry among my constituents, as it has across the country. I am a strong believer in the axiom, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. I wish I could with confidence simply ease my constituents' fears by saying our administration is fully prepared and has the situation under control. But right now I feel like saying so would be, generously speaking, a stretch of the truth. The Trump's administration's response has been at best lethargic, at worst incomprehensibly short-sighted. The budget you are presenting to our committee, to, to, committee today only stands to further weaken the agencies like the CDC that are critical to the response to the coronavirus outbreak. On top of, of that, the President and your department are requesting a mere $2.5 billion in emergency funding. You said it was a chess game. To put in context how insufficient this funding is, our Illinois go state government projects a 15 percent decrease in GDP in the worst case scenario of a widespread outbreak. That totals to $131 billion per year, per month, per year rather, or $10.5 billion per month. The state would need 1,000 state responders at the cost of $70 million every 30 days. Illinois alone will need 500,000 units of personal protective equipment, gowns, gloves, masks, face shields, per month totaling $35 million there. And the cost of the current standard 14 days of quarantine, including housing, food, medical support, and law enforcement, is estimated at 10,000 per individual. That's just for one person. These numbers are staggering, and that is only one state representing a mere fraction of the national need. You just said a few minutes ago that we need to prepare for all outcomes. Secretary Azar, do you think the President and your agency's budget request is sufficient to be prepared for just the most likely, let alone the worst case scenario? And if not, do you expect states, communities, and local hospitals will need to, in fact, be able to foot the rest of the bill? So we do believe it is the appropriate response for the remaining months of 2020, but the President has made it very clear that we will work with Congress on a bipartisan, bicameral basis to secure additional money such that Congress sees fit. I did want to mention it is not part of our doctrine for pandemic that we would be using mandatory institutional <laughs> quarantine like we've dealt with in Chicago there. Um, that's the unique circumstances of federal quarantine from these passengers coming in from out of the country um, in this active containment period. So it would not be part of the expectation for Americans that you would see well, this. It would be home isolation is really brief, much more what we the, would do. The case in California, is that person in quarantine? Or uh, because we are still in an active containment strategy, which is to put people into mandatory, con mandatory quarantine. At some point, if we were in a mitigation mode, people will stay at home, just like with severe flu. Okay, so, um, and just for the sake of time, uh, my constituents in general would feel more confident if we were preparing to protect us against the worst case, if we're asking for all the funding and never had to use it. But you're not, which is, I believe, unnecessarily putting our communities and our nation at risk when lives are at stake. And we also have to, and this may be a question you need to answer separately, deal with the logistical issues like supply chain management with stockpiling we need to be dealing with today, not tomorrow. Can you provide us with concrete examples of how the um, agency is preparing for shortages in supplies like gowns, masks, et cetera, and what you've done so far, what you plan to do in the future to make sure we have things placed where we need them, when they need them, as they need them? So we're already using on the transfer and reprogramming money to do initiate contracts for gowns and as well as N95 masks. And with the emergency supplemental funding that we hopefully will get, we will acquire massively more amounts of that, but we've started the seed contracts so we can build on those quickly. Uh, my time is up. I yield back to you. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Texas, uh, from Kansas, I'm sorry, Mr. Estes is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I want to start with thanking Secretary Azar for being here. I know it's uh, been a long morning already for you to uh, work through this. I know under, under your leadership, uh, HHS has been refocused to address some of the major issues that impact many Americans including in my district and across across Kansas. Um, we've got to remain committed to protecting access to quality rural health care, addressing the need for more transparency in our medical billing system, and ensuring that we're helping families in need. And I want to thank you for some of your policies that you put in the budget that would allow flexibility to combat substance abuse of, of any sign that it takes. Um, I know in our state, um, Methamphetamine is still an issue, uh, as well as opioids. And so I wanted to ensure that the, the state opioid response grant program 
addresses uh, all aspects of, of how to uh, treat those, those devastating addictions. Since last year, I've been working closely with uh, district attorneys and, and health care providers in, in the state, looking at how do we increase uh, uh, support against the, uh, those addiction programs. So I appreciate the support from the federal level and important that we make sure that we continue to make sure those federal resources get out to the states. Um, I do appreciate the, the administration's collaboration with Congress and, and uh, want to continue to help uh, improve our health care, make sure that we keep prescription drug prices lower, make sure we end surprise medical billing. Um, I also look forward to continuing all of this vital work with you. Um, I'm particularly here, uh, proud to hear about your announcement earlier today about the uh, former governor from Kansas, uh, Jeff Collier, uh, to head up the uh, HHS Rural Health uh, Initiatives. Um, our former governor and, uh, and, and, a, and a medical doctor, uh, Kansas know that uh, Dr. Collier is uh, dedicated to rural America and to patient well-being. Uh, I can personally attest to his qualifications and, and know his, that he's very fit for this initiative. Um, can you help uh, talk through a little bit about um, how you want to make sure that there's a major focus on rural health care in America with this, with this initiative? A absolutely. So. Uh, we really have four parts to our rural health care strategy, which involves, first, we've got to get an economically sustainable model, just as I was talking with Congressman Evans about. It's about we, we can't paper over facilities if the economic model doesn't work. We've got to make them work. So part of that was changing the, wa the wage index to redirect monies to rural hospitals. But then how do we make them actually sustainable? One of the budget proposals that I'm really excited about is to stop rural hospital closures is the critical access hospital plan that would let you switch to be an emergency room and outpatient and not have to be inpatient, as well as get you supplemental payments to, to enhance that work. So that, that for hospitals would be a great part of it. So that, that's a part of it. Happy to go into more detail. But I don't want to use up all your time. Okay, great. Thank you. Because there are some different initiatives and, and different hospitals that maybe have a different footprint in terms of how they were built uh, and changes in the community over time have, have, have had a major change. I do want to follow up with one other, one other comment uh, while I still have some time is that uh, we know you've been working uh, a lot. We've talked a lot this morning about the COVID-19, and, and it's critical that those rural areas also have access to, to protections against that. And we want to make sure that the funding uh, gets out to that rural areas as well. I mean, maybe it needs to be as much as 25 percent or even more of the funding to help make sure that it covers those rural areas and not just the urban areas. Particularly, I mean, using a tele telemedicine, uh, being able to prepare for staff shortages, uh, being able to address overflows from some of the urban areas that are that are over that are critically hit in terms of when when the crisis does hit. So um, I don't know if you've had some time to look through as you're working through this is uh, what are you looking at in terms of helping make sure the rural hospitals and, and uh, providers can help be part of this plan. As we work together on an emergency sup on money that would go to states, I think it's important that we make sure that gets out there because uh, the states make so many decisions. So that'll be criteria we work on with you all. Thank, thanks, Secretary. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Suwazi, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for taking the time to be here today. We appreciate it very much. I'm going to ask you just some very straightforward uh, yes and no questions to try and just establish a clear record on certain things. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you're the former president of Eli Lilly USA, is that correct? Yes, that, that's pretty clear. Mr. Secretary, is it true that Americans pay as much as four times as much for prescription drugs as people in other countries pay for the exact same drugs? Uh, it, the numbers that we have in Medicare Part B would demonstrate about 1.8 to two times what European and OECD countries. But in some instances, it could be much. In some instances, it's much higher. It could depend on the drug, but absolutely, and that's why the president has made getting drug prices down such a critical priority. Thank you, sir. Are you aware that in January of 2016, candidate Trump said that Medicare could save hundreds of billions of dollars by negotiating drug prices with big pharma companies? Uh, yes, I am aware. Are you aware that the president in January of 2017 said of Big Pharma, quote, these guys are getting away with murder? Yes, I am aware he said that. Are you aware that in December, the House of Representatives passed H.R. 3, the Bipartisan Drug Cost Now Act, which would empower you as the secretary to negotiate lower drug prices on behalf of the American people? I heard of that, yes. Are you aware that the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, estimates that just the negotiation aspect of H.R. 3 would save the federal government almost $500 billion over the next decade? It would also lead to dramatic reduction in new therapies for Alzheimer's, cancer, and I understand other that, that you're, that's your position, but do you know that the CBO says it'll save $500 billion? Yes, I do. Okay. Has the Trump administration endorsed H.R. 3? 
no, because we don't believe it can pass both chambers of Congress, okay, and, I understand. and we also don't believe it's You haven't endorsed it. Has the President endorsed any bill that allows the federal government to negotiate drug prices? Uh, we have been supportive of the grassley widen package, which would have inflation so Have you endorsed that bill? Uh, we, are, we are supportive of it, as we're supportive of other options also that would be bipartisan and bicameral. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Are you aware that when President Trump was running for president, he tweeted, quote, I was the first and only potential GOP candidate to state that there will be no cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Yeah, I'm aware he said that. Are you aware that recently, as this month, he said, quote, he tweeted, we will not be touching your Social Security or Medicare in the fiscal 2021 budget? I don't remember that quote. He did, he did do that, I'll just so you know. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask that uh, we have unanimous consent to insert into the record a statement from the American Hospitals Association uh, saying the following, quote, this budget would result in hundreds of billions of dollars of cuts that sacrifice the health of seniors, the uninsured, and low-income individuals. So ordered. Thank you, sir. Mr. Secretary, is it true that the budget proposal by the administration proposes to reduce Medicaid spending by $844 billion over the next 10 years through the allowance or the President's health reform vision? We reduced the rate of growth from 5.4 percent per year to 3.1 percent per year with growth in every single year of the budget period for the Medicaid program, even with those changes. Is it true that the administration proposes to cut Medicare through reduced payments to hospitals for uncompensated care by $88 billion over the next 10 years? We reduced the rate of growth of Medicare from 7.3 percent per year to 6.5 percent per year and extended the life of the program by over 25 years. Mr. Secretary, is it true that your budget proposes to cut Medicare spending through reduced payments to on-campus on hospital outpatient departments by $117 billion over the next 10 years? We propose to require site-neutral payments so hospitals can't game the system by where they locate providers and facilities. And finally, Mr. Secretary, is it true that your budget proposes to cut Medicare spending through reduced payments for off-campus facilities uh, that are hospital-owned physicians' office by $47 billion over the next 10 years? Again, we do propose that we have site-neutral payments so that you don't game the system by where you locate a facility. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I really appreciate your time today. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Brady. I appreciate both of you having this hearing. Secretary Azar, thanks for being here. Thank you for your service. Um, last night's press conference, press, the President referenced a vaccine being rapidly developed. A hearing earlier this week, an administration official testified that one would be ready within 1.5 months. You then today said three months. Where are we at on that? What is the timeline for no, a vaccine I'm, being available I'm, yeah. to address COVID-19? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you completely misrepresent what I said. Within three months I thought of you, the, I, and I apologize. Well, I, mean, within, I, didn't within, to, I did not mean to do okay. that. That's, just, what I, that's what I heard. So no, Dr. Fauci said within three months of the invention of the vaccine, it would enter phase one clinical trials within three months. So that's, that's what I referred to. Um, for the acting Secretary of Homeland Security, he was, he's not a doctor. He was asked a question and said several months. Um, we were very clear last night, Dr. Fauci, 12, eight, 12 to 18 months, likely time frame, and even that would be record speed for vaccine development. Understood, understood. In your role uh, as Secretary, will you commit to us that any vaccine that is develop, developed will be provided at no cost? or at a very low cost, at least, to the American public? Uh, I've directed my teams that if we do any joint venture with a private enterprise, that we're co-funding the research and development of the program, that we would ensure that there's affordable access to the fruits of that, whether vaccine or therapeutics. Okay. And God forbid, if a vaccine cannot be developed in a short period of time, what's your public health strategy? Uh, so our public health strategy is always based first and foremost on our state and local public health departments, the blocking and tacking of public health, which is identify cases, diagnose, treat, isolate, and contact trace. And that's where the emergency supplemental is so important to make sure we have adequate funding out there to those frontline workers and frontline public health people. Got it. Um, moving on, uh, you know, obviously we're getting a lot of calls, as you can tell. Our constituents are nervous and fearful, not just because of this virus, but uh, I admit, because of the way the administration is handling it. And as you know, one of the largest outbreaks of another virus, HIV, occurred in Indiana. It was a result of critical testing sites, Title X clinics, being closed due to cuts in state funding. When it was determined that the cases were spiking due to needle sharing, then Governor Pence failed to heed the advice of medical experts and really did slow walk the needed public health response. 
Now Vice President Pence has been named to lead the nation's response to a virus experts know little about incubation periods, specific modes of transmission, or short or long-term public health costs. Can you ensure us, Mr. Secretary, that HHS, HHS will follow the advice of the nation's leading medical experts and not delay implementation of the recommendations so that the health of untold numbers of Americans aren't jeopardized? I always follow the advice of my top public health career officials in these matters. They, these, we, we had them on stage last night. These are the best people in the world, and uh, I, I've known them for decades. I've worked with them for decades. I trust them completely, and, rep, and I'm very proud to represent them. Okay. Thank you. And in regards to um, uh, how long uh, the coronavirus lasts on surfaces, I mean, we're hearing hours, we're hearing over a week. What is it? What, how long does it uh, last on, we don't, a, on a we, surface? The, yeah, we call that fomite transmission. We don't have firm data. Dr. Fauci has said if it's consistent with normal coronavirus, he would expect several hours. But of course, we do have other viruses that can last on surfaces longer. We don't have study data on that yet. Okay. And like influenza, is a coronavirus affected by a change in the weather? Um, normal, the regular cold coronavirus is affected by change of weather, as is the flu, that type of respiratory illness. But um, SARS, MERS, for instance, which are also modified coronaviruses, um, they do not seem to have the same impact of warm weather in terms of impeding the, 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 the transmissibility of it as a respiratory illness. So we do not know with regard to the novel coronavirus what will happen when we hit warmer seasons. Appreciate your candor. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Marshawn, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, last November, CMS proposed a Medicaid Fiscal Accountability Regulation, or MFAR, uh, to improve accountability of the Medicaid system. Uh, we're very supportive of that Good job. and very supportive of what you're trying to accomplish. However, uh, our hospitals in Texas are encountering some difficulty with the implementation of that. And uh, we would like to secure your commitment uh, to sit down with them and uh, see before the final policy is implemented, uh, see if you would be willing to sit down with them, hear them out, and either clarify or make some uh, suggestions. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be happy to talk to them. I've, I've spoken with, with many members, senators about this issue, especially with Texas. We want to just make sure that we've got good integrity in the Medicaid system, and we want to work with states in a productive way. We, don't, we aren't looking for it to be penal. We want to be prospective in our outlook. Um, and we want to even, if there, if there are intergovernmental transfers that really are impermissible and not right, work with states to restructure the funding so that it can be on a sound footing. So that, that's the intent of it, and we want to work with states And uh, if we go forward with the regulation. So, uh, yes, the regulation is not completely formulated. You're not in, in a position to enforce it just yet? Oh, no, it's a proposal only. It's only a proposal at this point. Okay. So we're taking that feedback. We're taking it to heart. I'm hearing it <laughs> quite vigorously today, as I have throughout this week. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, the other issue I'd like to discuss with you quickly is uh, about home infusion. And uh, there's some confusion. I know you've heard this from another, the other committee in the House, Energy, Energy and Commerce, that uh, Congress passed legislation and in the proposed implementation of it, there is some concern among several congressmen. That I've got, I've been working on legislation with some Energy and Commerce. I'm working on some legislation with Ms. Sewell uh, that the congressional intent is not being followed. Can you comment on that? So we certainly want to follow the language that Congress passed, and I understand there, there's been concern about how the language was written. We want to make sure that people can receive care in their home in the appropriate setting. We believe in home-based care. Uh, and we actually implemented some temporary transitional payments for home infusion for 19 and 20 and finalized the permanent one. Um, we are trying as best we can to implement the congressional language passed, but uh, if Congress modifies that, we will be very glad to implement that also. We've tried to come up with solutions to ensure adequate home-based infusion services. Thank you very much. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to uh, compliment Mr. Marchant for the question on Medicaid. If you can see 
talking to the ranking member and to talking to the others on the committee today, this issue of that Medicaid waiver from Austin to Boston, it's pretty consistent, the apprehension that we all feel about that change. So we, we take you at your word that you're going to give us ample time to, to review the proposal. Thank you. Ab absolutely. We want, to work with the we want to work with the committee. This would be an important change, and we want to make sure that if it happens, if we do go forward with it, and we're getting the comment on that, um, that it's something that works for the system, brings integrity, but that doesn't bring undue harm to states or providers. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. I wanted to focus today on my concerns with the administration's management of the no uh, novel coronavirus, including programs within this committee's jurisdiction. Your overall supplemental funding request has been uh, determined to be inadequate to the circumstances, but I do see that you requested an increase from $1 million to $10 million for the U.S. repatriation program within the Administration for Children and Families, ACF, which I find interesting. Um, Secretary Azar, the ACF repatriation program is a human services program that provides temporary assistance to U.S. citizens returned to the United States. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. To, to your knowledge, is the program typically used to respond to mass health events? Uh, it's used whenever the State Department does a repatriation from abroad of American citizens to provide help for low-income individuals to resettle and with transitory assistance. We've had very few claims, but just as part of the SUP, we thought it prudent, as was done, I think, with Zika and some other situations, to ask for an increase just so that it would be covered in the event we had low-income individuals who thank, needed assistance. Thank you. Um, so do these employees, if they are used, have any background in public health emergency response? Um, this is this is funding. This is for ORR and supporting um, if they need transit back home once they land in the United States. If they have a human service need, let me um, let me let me. Let me um, this is not a health let issue. This let me, really let me rephrase my yeah. my question. Um, were any ACF repatriation employees part of the teams deployed to Travis and March Air Force Base to receive evacuees from Wuhan? Yes to, assist, yes, to assist with repatriation right. of American citizens, which is Thank part you. of the program. Yeah. Um, so you, what sort of health and safety training, if any, do these individuals receive? Uh, health and safety in terms of health needs of individuals? Well, they would no, be... Protocol, you know, they're well, going... They, any individual... Let me ask real quick, because yeah. let me ask another question. To your knowledge, were any of these ACF employees exposed to high-risk evacuees from China? Uh, for it was not Zika, Haiti, Hur and Hurricane Maria. I to your knowledge, were any of the ACF employees exposed to high-risk evacuees from China? They should never have been without appropriate PPE. What's PPE? That's a personal protective equipment. So that is one of the things that's required, right? To have equipment, to wear suits. If you were with anyone who's in quarantine, to maintain quarantine, that should be the case, yes. Okay. Um, are you aware, um, it is my understanding that, you know, there was a team, as you just confirmed, that was sent to uh, the March and Travis Air Force bases, and there was a lot of, it was kind of chaotic on the ground. Um, to your knowledge, were protocols followed at all times? Um, I would not accept your proposition that chaotic at all times, um, and I would, I would want to get a report no. from my team. I'm not aware of any violation of quarantine or, or isolation protocols. So you're not aware, okay. Um, may. Could there have been any um, protocols may have been broken given the perceived emergency and urgency of the situation on the ground? They should not be. Urgency does not, urgency does not compensate for violating isolation and quarantine protocols for personal protection, no. Okay. Um, do you think that um, breaking proto basic protocols and exposing untrained human service employees to the coronavirus before allowing them to be dispersed around the country could have endangered the employees and other Americans. Um, I don't believe that has taken place, and the isolation and quarantine protocols should always be followed according to whatever CDC or local, state and local public health officials have recommended. Okay. If they were not followed, say they weren't followed, what would be the steps to deal with the, those employees? Well, I'd want to know with the full facts, and we'd take appropriate remedial measures. Do you know who the employees that were part of these teams that were deployed to Travis and March Air Force Base? I don't know their names, no. A I have 83,000 employees. I apologize. I don't no, know no, all no. of their names. <laughs> but do you guys know who they are? Of course, yes. Okay. Yes. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, I uh, thank you for your time. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to inquire. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for your indulgence today. The Trump budget uh, proposal cuts the graduate medical education program by $52 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, this does not work for my home state of Nevada. We need more doctors, not cuts uh, to the very program that trains them. Nevada ranks 48th in the nation for primary care doctors. Uh, there are just over 180 full-time doctors for every 100,000 residents compared to 303 per 100,000 on, on average. Uh, I literally have parts of my district in the rural areas that do not have OBGYN services available, and there are only 259 OBGYNs in the entire state of Nevada. So how does the administration justify to Nevadans who desperately need to see a doctor but can't, can't find one uh, the, the cuts to the GME program? So I actually hope you'll take another look at this because for Nevada, with exactly the issues you raised, primary care, OBGYN, and rural, what we propose doing is taking Medicare, Medicaid, and children's GME, putting it instead all on the general fund and creating a flexible, more flexible fund that's not frozen in does time. Does that to add the, money to the GME program? It, it would pull down it over. It would pull money? down overall, but it would actually allow refocusing on does primary it, it care, OBGYN, and rural. So it actually, you might actually benefit. I'm asking from that, the question, from those Mr. Changes. Secretary. Does it add? No, it removes, as you said, I think okay. approximately so a billion. Money. But you might actually, your state might actually <laughs> benefit from those changes. No, we won't, because we need more resources, not less. The Trump budget also claims to improve access to rural health care, but it eliminates the Health Profession Opportunity Grant. Again, we have huge growth uh, and demand for home health aides, medical insurance coders, medical assistants. I introduced a bill, H.R. 3342, the Health Providers Training Act, which was included in H.R. 3, the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug Cost Now Act. Do you believe that eliminating the HPOG training program will help the existing health care workforce shortage in the United States? The Health Professions Program funds institutions. We believe in the Health Service Corps, which actually gets us health care providers going to rural underserved areas as a tuition reimbursement program, a forgiveness program. So HPOG doesn't help to meet our we huge don't. We don't believe shortage. it provides discernible results in terms of the shortages, unlike the National Health Service Corps, which we are very committed to. Lastly, a number of my colleagues asked about the issue about drug pricing. You said earlier that President Trump uh, is willing to uh, consider a bill that is brought forward through this process. But then candidate Trump said that he was going to lead on this issue and force drug companies to negotiate. What's changed? Well, we have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate. So he doesn't believe that the leadership of the executive branch is important to uh, fulfilling his promise to lower? He, he, the has, he has been leading. This issue of drug pricing has been led by him, but we do need the two sides, the two chambers and the two parties to get together to pass something for the American people. We've well, got some and really good the, options out there. We need the president's leadership to follow through on a campaign promise that he made to the American people to lower drug costs. Our committee has passed H.R. 3, the Elijah Cummings Lowering Drug Cost Act Now bill. That is a bill that caps uh, out-of-pocket expenses. It allows Medicare to negotiate for the first time uh, directly with drug companies, which overwhelmingly Americans believe should be done. Um, and it makes sure that there's actually transparency uh, in the process. So I just would hope that the administration would follow through on its commitment. I know you have prior uh, affiliations uh, with a drug manufacturer, as my colleagues have pointed out. But this is important to the American people, and it's important that we follow through on our promise. With that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to inquire. Thank the chairman, and uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here today. My colleague, uh, Ms. Walerski, mentioned that uh, you're a Hoosier, but I don't know that a lot of people know you actually got your start in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. So, listen, thank you for being here today, and I, and I know this, uh, you're taking time to be here is really critical uh, for all of us. Uh, I just want you, if you could, uh, just repeat again, and I, I mean, it's hard to talk about the President's budget when, and say it's not providing things and we don't have another budget to compare it to. You made a statement about Medicare, and you said it gets another 25 years of life under this budget. That's something I think that needs to be repeated and repeated and repeated 
because we keep throwing out this other information that somehow it stops. That's right. Right now, Medic the Medicare Hospital Trust Fund, which this committee has jurisdiction over, will go bankrupt, I believe, in 2026. With the changes that we propose, which are changes that really are for providers, they make no change to beneficiary access or beneficiary benefits, would extend the life of the trust fund by 25 years or more and still grow Medicare, grow Medicare annually at 6.5%, 6.5% growth throughout the period. Okay, I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, uh, the longer and the louder you say something, the more it becomes true. I think we need to talk more about what's really happening in the truth as opposed to uh, trying to scare people. Uh, there's one thing I do want to thank you for. Uh, another, there's a lot I want to thank you for, but I don't have enough time to do it. Uh, we have a huge problem today with foster care funding and adoptive care funding. And uh, in uh, Mr. Evans' city of brotherly love, uh, right now the Supreme Court's going to hear a case. I, I find it almost uh, incredibly hard to understand how we can say that the faith-based community, which was the start of adoptive care and foster care, no longer can receive federal funds because they discriminate against the LBGTQ community. And it seems to me that discrimination means, look, if you don't agree with me, then, then you're discriminating against me. And it only goes one way. It doesn't go both ways. So I want to thank you for HHS's position on that and pushing on pro-life issues. And on this issue, this is incredibly important. This is about kids. This is not about different parts of our society or, or some, some movement uh, that yearns for all kind of, of spotlight on it. It's about kids. 400,000 they're looking for foster care and 100,000 looking for adoptive care. And if we're going to attack the very start of where this all began, that's in the faith-based community, then I think we better go back and actually take a look at history and how things work. Um, so I, I guess as we keep going on and on, and, and one of the things that you, you referenced, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Davis brought this up, is about uh, insulin. Uh, I'm a type 2 diabetic. Uh, there's, a, there's 7 million type 1 diabetics, and there's 30 million total diabetics. But one of the things that bothers me is we cannot develop a generic substitute. I know we talk about biosimilars, but when you talk about biosimilar, just concentrate on the similar of it, not the exact replica, which is a generic uh, substitute that we need to develop. On March 23rd of 2020, about 25 days from now, that's going to sunset under a provision that was put in the Affordable Care Act. And for the life of me, I can't understand why that was part of the Affordable Care Act. Why would we not encourage and try to develop a clear and permanent path for makers to go ahead and attempt to, to develop a generic substitute, which would slash the cost of, of, of insulin? I, and I get the biosimilar part, but I just don't understand why we can't have the generic substitute. And I keep banging my head against the wall because I can't find anybody that says, you know what, I agree with what you're saying, but I can't be on that bill with you. And the question is, why in the hell can't you? Um, I, I do think that FDA would say the biosimilar pathway with the, by, with the interchangeable guidance we put out is actually the speedier path to a pharmacy level flipped insulin that would effectively genericize that industry. So I, we're happy to brief you on that. I think it actually will do exactly what you want, the pathway that we've got right now. Okay, let's, let's get the briefing because we're running out of time on this. And honest to God, it, this is something that just is bizarre to me. When the cost of insulin since 2001 has gone up over 600%, I can go to Canada or I can go to, the, uh, go to, the, uh, over to Europe and buy it for a fraction of what, what's being charged today. So thank you so much for thank being here gentlemen. today. I appreciate your time and your devotion. Thank you, gentlemen. Recognize the gentle lady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Azar, for your service and for being here um, before this committee today. I really appreciate your leadership when it comes to reducing the cost of um, prescription drugs. And I'm hopeful that between the House, the Senate, and the White House, that we can get a good, strong, and bipartisan bill over the finish line this year because it's only bills that make it all the way through that can have a significant and immediate impact on the lives of my constituents and provide much needed relief for them at the pharmacy counter. But I, I have to be honest, um, if you want to understand why so many people are cynical about politics in this country, you really need to look no further than the administration's budget request for HHS. The administration is proposing draconian and dangerous cuts to key public health investments, ranging from Medicaid to SSBG, which helps prevent elder abuse. And this includes deep cuts to accounts used to combat the coronavirus, which poses a growing threat to global health and global economy. And the administration is recommending many of these cuts in the name of fiscal responsibility. 
you know, I'm sorry, but the insincerity here is almost too much to bear. You can't pass a partisan tax bill that primarily helps the very wealthy and explodes our deficits, and then turn around and cite those very deficits as the basis um, for your proposals to severely cut critical accounts that protect the safety and well-being of everyday Americans. And it's not principled, nor is it even responsible. It's really the height of hypocrisy. Excessive debts and deficits threaten our economy, our security, and our children's future. Policymakers must work to bring government revenues and spending into better alignment. And it's hard to make bipartisan progress on this issue when Republicans approach our fiscal problem in such a cynical and imbalanced way. Turning to the little bit of substance, you know, there's been a lot of talk about coronavirus today and for good reason. Earlier this month, I convened a roundtable of experts in my Central Florida district to give my constituents accurate information about the coronavirus, helping them separate fact from fiction. And my goal is to ensure that people are vigilant, not apathetic, but not alarmist either. I have some experience with pandemics. In 2005, when I worked at the Department of Defense, I helped to lead the department's response to the um, threat posed by the avian flu, working in coordination with other departments and agencies. And that experience really taught me about the importance of public education, of coordination, um, of a whole of government approach, of preparedness, and finally, proper funding. And I'm confident Congress will do what the administration neglected to do, which is to properly fund key accounts used to combat coronavirus at home and abroad in the coming fiscal year. I'm also confident we'll work together to enact an emergency supplemental bill to fund essential anti-coronavirus efforts that are needed right now. Um, I don't believe that there's any time to waste. Mr. Secretary, picking up on a theme uh, raised by Congresswoman Moore and others, you proposed to eliminate SSBG, the largest source of federal funding for child and adult protective services. And this account helps state agencies prevent and punish acts of abuse and neglect against vulnerable people. And in 2017 alone, my home state of Florida received over $91 million for this purpose. And Florida is home to the largest percentage of seniors in the country, and elder abuse and neglect occurs all too often. Can you explain to me why your agency wants to eliminate funding that protects vulnerable children and seniors? So the SSBG is basically a large fund of money that goes out that doesn't have discernible, me measurable outcomes in an environment where we're focused on eliminating programs that either are proven and effective uh, or don't have discernible well, results. Do you have a substitute program for how we to do. protect so we actually, our vulnerable so the, children and seniors? So, so, of course, within our administration for community living, we, we funded actually increased by $2 million the Adult Protective Services Program. We flat fund the Senior Medicare Patrol and the Long-Term Care Ombudsman critical programs to ensure the protection of our seniors. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Murphy. Uh, with that, the Secretary is uh, acknowledged for his time with us today. Members should be advised that they have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be part of the formal hearing record. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And with that, the Ways and Means Committee stands adjourned. Thanks, Kevin.